Okay, we are live. Sergeants, will you begin your recordings? Recording to PC. Recording to, recording to cloud. Backup is rolling. Thank you, Sergeant Hope. You may begin to open. Thank you. Good morning, and welcome to today's New York City Council Remote Hearing on Public Safety jointly with the Committee on Women and Gender Equity. At this time, with all panelists, please turn on your videos. I repeat, all panelists, please turn on your videos. Thank you. To minimize disruption, please place all electronic devices to vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. I repeat, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chairs, we are ready to begin. Good morning and, and thank you. Good morning, good morning. Welcome to today's very important hearing on Wolversite. NYT, NYPD Special Victims, or as we know it, SVD. I'm Council Member Dharma V. Diaz. My pronouns are he, sure, he, she, and hers. I am the Chair of the Committee on Women and Gender Equity. We are also joined by Committee on Public Safety, which is chaired by my colleague, Council Member Adrian Adams. In the, committee's la the committee last met for hearing on SVD in, in 2018. At the hearing, committee reviewed a DOI report that found SVD to be unsatisfied, under-resourced for at least nine years and revealed internal NYPD documents that acknowledged that many sexual assault cases were not properly investigated as a result. Among the findings was that stranger rape and high profile cases were given priority for limited resources over acquaintance rape and that victims were at times re-traumatized. Inexperienced investigators during questioning. In response, NYPD refuted the DOI report and swiftly added another 20 detectives to SVD, bringing the division up to detectives investigating 5,600 crimes annually. This is why I am very concerned and saddened to hear that many of these issues persist. A group of sexual survivors recently called and the US Department of Justice to open investigation into SPD for mismanagement, including a lack of experienced investigators. Again, lack of inexperience, it should not be in 2021. Key evidence being overlooked and the treatment of victims as if they did something wrong. Additionally, there are victims that, that LGBTQI plus definitely labeled individuals are treated less fairly by investigators, impossible. In the three years since our last hearing, SVD has added staff and installed a new commander. We are also mostly weathered the pandemic today. I'm looking forward to hearing about how NYT, NYPD responses to these claims and how COVID has impacted SVD. I'm also very much looking forward to hearing from the advocates and survivors. Thank you advocates for stepping forward. For whom we are very grateful for sharing their personal experiences with us in this policy, in form of better policy, rather. This is a public safety crisis and victims and survivors deserve much better. Before we turn to testimony, I'd like to thank Derry Cossum, my, my communications and legislative director, Sergeant of Arms, and who are working very hard to bring this committee hearing possible. Chloe, the committee senior policy analyst, and issue right the finance unit head. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues that are here today. Okay, Kenneth Brandon Holden, thank you for being here today. I'm going to look a little further and see who I see. Of course, Chair Adams, where are the rest of my colleagues? I will come back and inform who, are, who my colleagues have joined as I can see them on my screen. Thank you. Turning it now over to Chair Adams for her statement, the opening statement, thank you. Thank you very much, Chair Diaz, and good morning to everyone who's here this morning. I'm Councilmember Adrienne Adams of the 28th District in Queens. 
and I am the chair of the Public Safety Committee. I want to thank the members of the Public Safety Committee who are here. I believe uh, Chair Diaz uh, named some. Uh, we also have Council Member Riley, Cabrera, Powers, Rose, and Rosenthal. I also want to thank the sponsors of the bills, Council Member Rose, Council Member Rosenthal, and Council Member Chin. The hearing we're holding today is of paramount importance. Survivors of sexual assault deserve to feel supported and respected by the people responsible for solving crime in New York City. In 2018, the City Council enacted laws aimed at addressing just this. Local Laws 189, 192, 193, and 194 of 2018 increased training for Special Victims Division investigators and patrol officers, codified secure case management systems within the SVD, and increased oversight of staffing and caseloads. Today, we seek to gauge the NYPD's implementation and level of compliance with these laws. Additionally, we will hear new bills, which aim to increase transparency in the outcomes of NYPD special victims cases and ensure that all law enforcement officers receive appropriate training on responding to incidents of sexual crime, domestic violence, and human trafficking. Together, this legislation serves as testament that we, and the NYPD takes sexual assault very, very seriously and are committed to doing all within our power to support survivors. I will now allow for the sponsors of today's bills to deliver their remarks. Council members Rosenthal, then Council member Rose. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Rosenthal or Rose, whoever wants to go first. Uh, there we I go. Guess. Sorry, I was waiting. I didn't see the unmute. Thank you very much. I appreciate you. And boy, do I appreciate council members um, Adams and Diaz for holding this hearing uh, and giving us an opportunity to see um, how the NY. PD has done its progress to improving outcomes for sexual assault survivors. Um, and uh, before I get started, I do just want to note on um, in that the DOI report was focused on the adult cases um, in the SVD. And in um, those units, unfortunately, staff has not um, changed um, over the years. Uh, although I do appreciate the fact that staffing for the entire division SVD has increased by roughly 20 um, people. I wanna focus for a minute today on Council Member Cumbo's terrific bill 189, which required all new recruits to get sensitivity training for responding to survivors of harassment and sexual assault and ongoing training um, for all uniform members uh, whose responsibilities include routinely interacting with victims of crime, specifically getting interactive training um, on a biennial basis to assist them in responding to survivors of harassment and sexual assault. And the reason I um, draw our eye there is um, because it is the all officers who often find themselves um, responding to domestic violence cases in particular. And I want to um, start by saying that responding to sexual assault cases is a daunting responsibility. We ask a lot of our uniformed officers, whether they be neighborhood coordinating officers or a detective in the SVD or um, a domestic violence officer. Um, they have to deeply understand trauma-informed survivor-centric techniques as they come face-to-face -face with 
domestic violence or sexual assault survivors or those who are trafficked for sex. Specifically focusing on the DV calls, you know, every year the NYPD responds to around 230,000 DV calls, about 600 every day. Um, but the officers responding are not necessarily trained to recognize the complexity of a situation and the critical importance of follow up. A month ago on September 9th, 2021, we lost one year old legacy Beauford, um, Buford. And according to news reports, the police had been to the home multiple times and an SVD detective had visited the home as well. Responding officers reported that they observed the children in the apartment to be in good health with no visible marks or injuries. When SVD got involved, it was to investigate a possible case of sexual abuse of Legacy's older brother. But again, according to the news, the police investigation was closed and no children were examined or interviewed. Just a few days later, on September 12th, we lost four-year-old JC Eubanks. The police had been called repeatedly by neighbors concerned about domestic violence. Even JC's daycare called the police after noticing bruises on JC and his sibling. And while Safe Horizon did come in to interview them, SVD officers were present, but did not follow the protocols which require follow-up visits with the family, a forensic pediatrician examination, talking to neighbors, and most importantly, submitting a domestic, a domestic incidents report, which would have triggered a domestic violence officer visiting the home. My bill would seek to improve the NYPD's response to DV, sexual assault, and human trafficking victims. Um, first, it would bring experts together to develop an appropriate training curriculum I think this is so important to have representatives from um, many different agencies in the city um, and within the NYPD, the, the Sex Crimes Unit, Collaborative Policing and the DV Department, as well as providers who are working in these areas um, hopefully with an eye toward including survivors of sexual assault, DV, or human trafficking. I love that they would uh, come together to develop a training program, but then come back together repeat again and again to think about how better to improve the system. So each police officer would be required to take the three-hour training that um, this interagency group came up with. It, it would have to be supplemented by additional trainings, including at least monthly at roll call on topics to enhance the police response to domestic violence, sexual assault, and human trafficking. The accountability component would require the NYPD to report on the number of officers trained, the dates of the training, and the curriculum for each training session. Specifically for DV accountability, it would we would um, further enhance the system by creation of a DV fatality committee, which similarly would be made up of a truly interdisciplinary set of people. They would review anonymized cases four times a year to develop recommendations regarding the coordination and improvement of services for victims of domestic violence provided by all city agencies and the nonprofit organizations that serve survivors. Um, by working together in this collaborative way, I'm hopeful we can prevent the next fatality and treat survivors with dignity and trauma-informed support. Thank you.
Thank you, Council Member Rosenthal. Rose? On that. Yes, go ahead. Um, and I was oh. just going to say, if Council Member Rose wants to give her testimony a little later, um, I think that would be helpful too. But Council Member Rose. So um, I probably will have uh, much more to add um, at the end. Um, but I, I want to thank uh, Council Members Adam and Diaz um, and, and everyone who thought it important enough to, to be in attendance at this meeting today. Um, my name is Council Member Debbie Rose, and I am one of the prime sponsors of um, 1488. And this law would amend the administrative code of the city of New York to require the police department to obtain information about the disposition of sex offense cases and require the mayor's office of sex offense um, and require the mayor's office of criminal justice to report on the outcomes of sex offense cases. The NYPD Special Victims Division maintains records of the number of sex related complaints it receives and the subsequent arrests that are made. However, the SVD lacks the information about the number of convictions that are achieved relative to these sex arrests. Information and data about convictions in sex-related cases is necessary to both the NYPD and the City Council in terms of assessing the efficacy of policing and prosecuting these offenses. Um, and, and as everyone stated already in 2018, we enacted a package of bills that were designed to raise the bar relative to the performance of NYPD in policing adult sex crimes. The bills address the issues raised by the Department of Investigation um, Office of Inspector General, specifically in the areas of SVD staffing, training, and case management systems. Um, I would just uh, like to add that um, these the bills that are attached to today's hearing are are really necessary to improve um, the spirit of transparency um, that we've been trying to um, uh, increase, um, um, and the spirit will improve the dynamic um, in the relationship between law enforcement and the community it serves and to make sure that victims get the best service um, that they could possibly get. Um, I would like to end my remarks by thanking all of my staff who helped in preparing for this, this hearing. And um, I'll probably uh, say something at the end of the hearing. Thank you so much. Thank you, chairs. Thank you, my colleagues for participating in today's hearing and for your testimony. I'd like to acknowledge Councilman Powers and Councilwoman Lewis as well that have joined us. Thank you, and I'll turn it over to the moderator. Committee Council, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> thank you. Um, I'm Josh Kingsley, Council to the Committee on Public Safety. Before we begin testimony, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you're called on to testify, after which you'll be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called, and I will periodically be announcing who the next panelist will be. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask questions of the administration or any specific panelists, please use the Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on you in order. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Um, our first panelist to give testimony today will be a member of the public uh, named Christine, and she will be followed by the NYPD. So we will begin now. Thank you. Thank you, Christine, for your willingness to, to share your story with us. Thank you. Hello, my name is Christine. Last September of 2020, I was sexually assaulted. In this short time, I cannot detail the extent of my experience with multiple levels of the NYPD and Special Victims Unit, investigative and procedural callousness, incompetence, and negligence. I plan to submit a detailed comprehensive written testimony within 72 hours of this meeting's adjournment. 
Beginning with my botched rape investigation, it has been difficult to experience firsthand the systemic incompetency and lack of investigative effort. Despite personally preparing a comprehensive 13 page document detailing the incident with supplementary documents, including related images, screenshots, phone numbers, and a blueprint I designed myself of the perpetrator's home. The first detective failed to conduct a basic uh, investigation, let alone a thorough one. The detective did not interview viable witnesses or retrieve now lost footage from the bar I was last seen publicly. Instead, he insisted I partake in a traumatizing controlled phone call with the man who raped me. After no updates in the month following my report, I called the detective myself only to find out my case had been closed. Had I not called, I never would have found out. Seeking to understand how my case could have been closed, I was met with the NYPD and Special Victims Unit's lack of transparency. My experience aggressively self-advocating for basic information about my rape case, an endeavor that took nearly six months after my case was closed, reflects badly on the NYPD and Special Victims Unit. To see the values of courtesy, professionalism, and respect on every NYPD police car is an insult to my experience. I'm proud to say that I successfully reopened my rape case via Zoom in late March 2021. Unfortunately, the second detective, considered one of the best in the field, proved just as unhelpful. She not only lacked follow through to complete a thorough investigation, but also failed to advocate for GHB hair testing after special victims unit collected hair samples. I would have needed to pay over $1,000 out of pocket for this procedure. As I speak, my hair samples remain untested in the lab. Why am I paying for a crime committed against me? Less than a month ago, my case was closed for a second time without a thorough investigation and without the courtesy of letting me know. The problems within the NYPD and Special Victims Unit have not been addressed, identified, or remedied. One of the glaring issues in the, is the quality, not solely quantity, of detectives within Special Victims Unit. Detectives must exhibit exemplary critical thinking and strategizing skills, trauma-conscious care, and psychological and sociological awareness of and ongoing continuously updated training education on the complexities of rape and rape culture. Despite my initial faith in the NYPD's ability to arrest the man who raped me, the only arrest that has been made is on my ability to move on with my life as the burden of this case continues to fall on me. As a survivor, I have advocated, investigated, and strategized for my case all while managing the emotional, psychological, and physiological impact of my traumatic experience. Meanwhile, the detectives receiving salaries to investigate my case failed to do the minimum. Thank you. Thank you again, Christine, for, for sharing your horrific experience with us all today. Thank you for having me. I'm open to any questions any members of the council or the NYPD have for me as I'm happy to um, further expand or explain anything that I spoke about today. I see Chair Rothenthal has a question. Can we unmute Councilwoman Rothenthal, please? Thank you. Appreciate that, Chair. Starting Jim. time. Thank you. Christine, thank you for coming forward. Um, thank you for coming forward and sharing your story with us. Um, I happen to know that you're getting uh, some counseling services, and I'm really, I can, I can see that in your testimony. You are a strong um, strong person, uh, it's a hell of a story. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm a little bit gobsmacked. It's hard to, um, know where to begin. Um, 
so um so one of the things it was our understanding um that would happen is that when survivors came in to um, the SVU, they would be given a sheet of paper that just uh, allowed them to understand um, what to expect when they were uh, visiting with their detective that day and how to access more resources, counseling services. Did you ever receive a piece of paper like that? I did not receive a paper like that. I will say I received a lot of paperwork, overloaded with paperwork at the hospital that I went to. And I will say as a survivor that paperwork is not very helpful. Um, it does not begin to uh, make the process easier. And I also want to mention that I was not told my victim's rights. And in that six month, process of me advocating for myself did I found out that I was entitled to an advocate present during any part of the procedure um, I was not told by the first detective and the first detective quite frankly felt like he had more important things to do when I was in SVU he kept looking at the clock and the you know, I heard you say that officers receive sensitivity training, and I'm wondering if it resonates with them as my experience proves otherwise. Yeah, I mean, if you, you know, the one of the bills required the NYPD to report on that sensitivity, sensitivity training and the attendance, and unfortunately, um, the report document themselves that for each of the classes, you know, at most maybe eight detectives attended one of the classes. Um, uh, so, so thank you for bringing attention to that imperative. Um, would it be possible, I would be interested in seeing the paperwork that you got from the hospital and, um, and, and perhaps meeting offline to understand that better as well. Um, did, um, you know, there's a sheet of paper that the detective is supposed to go through when they're speaking with you at the unit where they're asking about certain things and, um, um, you know, did they ask you if there was, if you thought there might be video available and do you know if they ever I know what you said I heard you but I just am so gobsmacked I want to sort of hear it again did they ever follow up on trying to find that video um no that was something that we further investigated after I advocated for my case to be reopened and yeah. The fact that it took so much longer after my case was closed, I feel really botched the investigation and, you know, really closed on any hopes of real justice, you know? Yeah. Um, so the video was gone by the time anyone looked for it? Yes. And the restaurant or the bar let the second deck know that video is regularly deleted after about a week. And so... Um, it was really disappointing, you know. But they responded I, within a week, they could have seen it. Yes. Yes. And I'm sure that's sort of common practice. I'm expired. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop in in deference to other people, but um Christine, I um admire you. I'm humbled by you. Thank you for coming before the council today. Uh, your testimony is going to have an impact. And, um, you know, what I hear from you is that the system let you down. And, and I think you're right. It's the whole system. It's not just one officer or another or um, one department. The whole system let you down. And, um, and, and uh, 
I, I hope everyone listening, I certainly have taken that all to heart. Thank you, Christine. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal. Um, and thank you, Christine, as well. If any other council members have any questions, oh, I see Councilmember Rose's hand is raised. Um, go ahead, Councilmember Rose. Starting time. Thank you. Um, first, all, I want to thank you, Christine, for your courage um, to, to come forth. Um, uh, and the fact that you were re victimized. Um, is something that's not lost on us. Uh, the purpose of all of these bills has been that women continue to be re-victimized by, even when they have the courage to come forward to tell their stories, um, they are not given the, the help that they, they deserve or, or the justice. Um, I, I just have... Um, one question, you, you mentioned that your case was not only closed once, but twice. Um, was there any, did they tell you why your case was closed? Um, and, and what was it based on? It always falls on the lack of finding probable cause to warrant an arrest. And the second time it was closed, I actually kept it open as the second detective tried to close it multiple times. And I remember being on a phone call with said detective and strategizing with her, um, bringing up multiple avenues of social media investigations, bringing up multiple avenues of triangulation and narrowing down on um, people who are either present at the uh, scene of the crime or outside of it. And I even tried very hard to help her um, connect me with someone that could get me tested for the GHB for the, the hair testing. And no matter how many times I provided all those different avenues, it always came down to lacking probable cause. And before, I mean, and then after a while, because the second detective probably got tired of me continuing to fight for my case to be reopened, this detective eventually didn't have the courage herself to let me know that the case was closed until like less than a month ago. So my case was closed actually, my case was closed actually three months ago. So by the time I called her, the case was closed for two months after that. How do they, um, I, I'm not quite sure how you determine lack of probable cause if you don't, ex um, examine the the evidence uh it it just it, it boggles my mind that that you know that that could be the reason um and so what what would you say might have attributed to to um them sort of being that type of dismissive attitude is it um do you think it was like apathy is it uh, lack of training, um, the fact that um, their uh, techniques in, in uh, gathering criminal, you know, um, evidence, um, is it that it wasn't a high profile case? What, do you have any sort of, were you given any kind of indication why this, um, dismissive attitude? I can only speak on my experience and I can actually give two answers, one with the first detective and one with the second detective. With the first detective, it felt as if there was an apathy. I felt that with him, considering that I gave him all of the information, 13 pages worth, and this isn't just any document, I actually formatted landscape made a table and it was organized by date, time, event, if there was penetration or not, and what was going on in my head as to what was, it, it's so comprehensive. And I even made sure that I did it right after I reported the rape. So he had everything. And also to mention, he noted how thorough it was. 
So mm -hmm. I'm guessing with the first detective, it was apathy or just plain laziness. With the second detective, she definitely had a lot more empathy. However, because she was made to pick up the pieces of an investigation that happened, I mean, a crime that happened so long ago by the time she had gotten right. it, it became hard for her to really. It was cold. Find. It's like a cold case. Not only that, you know, she, I think, was at her own wits. I'm end. expired. So she wasn't able to go. Up. And the fact that, you know, I, as much as I'm upset that I had to help her strategize, you know, I come from a, the digital age, whereas she comes from a different generation. And so there is definitely a generational gap. And now that perpetrators, I'm sure, are using a lot of technology and a lot of um, harsher drugs out there. I do empathize with the second detective, but not too much because of the fact that she didn't advocate for my hair testing. I, I just want to ask, uh, did, did you think that... Um their uh their use of technology was used to um the best um their best ability or or did they even uh perform the effort they didn't perform the effort based on the fact that i had to go back and unblock the people that led to my soul and i had to go back myself watch their videos and link her the exact videos and at one phone call she actually made me held me responsible for that duty she goes well you didn't give me the video so what am i supposed to do and that's the tone she's taken with me on the phone call and made it feel like it was up to me to figure things out which is why in my testimony i said i was taxed with investigating advocating and strategizing for my own case which is why i don't have a lot of sympathy for the caseload of things because this had happened to me and i was still fighting for it I want to thank you. Um, my time is up. I, I want to thank, thank you. you again for for having the courage. And and I hope through this, the your testimony here today, we are able to uh, get you some other result to um, this heinous crime. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, chairs. Thank you, Councilmember. We'll now turn to Councilmember Diaz, followed by Councilmember Adams for additional questions. Go ahead, Chair Diaz. Christina, um, again, thank you for sharing your horrific story with us today. And I know my question to you is, Lisa, of your worries, but I'm interested in knowing you indicated personal um, income uh, that, you, that you provided to help traveling your case, $1,000. I'm curious to know the Crime Victims Board reimbursed you for the $1,000, or has anyone had a similar conversation with you? No, I've actually asked multiple times to the second detective if there was anyone that she could refer me to in order to advocate for my hair testing. She repeatedly said, it's not my department. I've never had to hair test before, so it's out of my hands. Not only that, I also reached out to the men who also uh, took my hair samples as they gave me their numbers in case I had any questions. I texted them as they said I could. I never heard back from them. In addition to that, I was you know like you know like i said tasked to pay over a thousand dollars for my hair testing and oh and then also by the fact that i even asked her because i went so deep and i said look i'm trying to help you just tell me and i'm not trying to put you on the spot this is me talking to detectives like i'm not trying to put you on the spot it, are the departments so disjointed and so isolated from each other that it's difficult for you to contact anyone that could help me find an advocate for hair testing. Like I even went that far and that thorough in my questioning. And she said, no, it's not that it's disjointed. It's not that it's disorganized. It's just that I've never done this before. I don't have, this is where my part ends. And so just even in my inquiries, I put a lot of attention and just like the, just like the trajectory, the force, everything. And it, it didn't matter. All I got was a no. And then I had to pay for over a thousand dollars for my hair to be tested, which is basic testing procedure to, you know, and this is after I told her, you can't find probable cause. She was, I can't find probable cause. And I said, what about hair testing? If there's GHB, there's your ticket, there's your in, and then we have probable cause to which she said, it's out of my hands. I, I, that's not my department. That's not my department. I'm, I, I've heard that so many times. I'm sorry to hear of your experience. It's her department. It was her case. 
it was her responsibility, as far as I'm concerned, for to figure it out and turn you on to someone. That's why we have supervisors, commanders, lieutenants. That should have been the answer if she had no answer. I'm going to turn it over back to, to council. I'm not sure who else of the members um, have further questions. As we are doing the second round, I do want to acknowledge Councilwoman Chaka, Councilmember Gennaro, Councilmember Gibson, and Councilmember Miller. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Diaz. I'll also acknowledge Councilmember Lander who joined us. I'm going to, to Chair Adams now for a question. Go ahead, ma'am. Thank you very much, Council. Um, Christine, you know, I, I'm just sitting here so frustrated for you. Uh, I am so sorry that you are going through this still as we're here this morning. It sounds to me like you, for the most part, have been your own detective in your own case. And for me, that is extremely unacceptable and it's appalling to me. It is appalling to me that we have mandated training for this division. And it doesn't seem that training has taken place. It doesn't seem like training has taken, and it doesn't seem like anybody even cares mm -hmm. about what's going on in this division. So, you know, I'm not gonna vent on you. I apologize for that. Um, I, I just wanna know, how many calls would you say were actually initiated by detectives to you in your behalf compared to how many calls you actually initiated in your own behalf on this case? I would say for every five call phone calls I made, it was like one. Um, and that I think that's like the minimum. I also emailed the first detective when the case was closed. I also texted the second detective and I actually had to be a bit adamant and a little aggressive in my tone before she had the courage to even let me know that the case was closed two months ago. Uh, that the case was closed two months ago, which this phone call happening less than a month ago. And she even told me about a different case she was working on and details of that case. Like, I don't need to know that there is a man on a red motorcycle going around grabbing girls. But she goes, I'm dealing with that, so I can't deal with yours right now. And I'm just sitting here going, what? I'm giving you guys everything, everything. And I'm calling so diligently and so promptly, showing up to things very promptly, making sure I have everything that I feel is important to this case. And it just lands on nothing. And so, yeah. To, to short answer to your question, like five to one, definitely. Well, truly that's unacceptable. Um, just the sheer unprofessionalism, one, and insensitivity to this matter, too, is just so disheartening to me. And again, I'm just so sorry that you have been victimized twice. Um, and I thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Adams. We're going to turn for a second question from Councilmember Rosenthal before uh, passing it back to the administration for their testimony. If um, any other council members would like to ask a question for Christine before we do so, use the Zoom raise hand function. If not, Chair Rosenthal, please go ahead. Starting time. Thank you so much, uh, Christine. I don't want to belabor this, but I just want to get this on the record um, because um, we, I, I really, um, have appreciated that the NYPD has continued to meet with the advocates and and um, you know take take their ideas and tell us they've put them into practice. So um, we worked really hard. They worked really hard on uh, a, a, a piece of paper called uh, for the survivor, sort of what to expect. Could, could you just, and, and on that paper, you have an opportunity to write down the name of the detective and some of the details of what's going on. Did you receive that piece of paper? No. And secondly, um, there's, there's a report called a discontinuance of participation form. Did you ever consent to, uh, were you ever asked if you wanted to discontinue your case and consent to signing that form? No. And lastly, you, you 
you you mentioned you were required, you were asked to do a controlled call? It was the only option given to me as to try to move forward with the investigation. Um, I even, when I first started, I even asked like, look, if he did it once, he'll do it again. You know, I'm willing to do something about yeah. it. He goes, no, 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 just a controlled phone call. And in this controlled phone call, I was called stupid, crazy. By whom? Uh, by the rapist during that phone call. And he was shouting at me and the entire time the detective is, you know, recording all that. And I just don't know how any rapist is going to admit what they did. And if they, and then if you look at my report, you can tell that there was a plan. I mean, after I was assaulted, there was a cleanup man who came by the house and cleaned the entire house, the entire house. None Ooh. of the, there was, a, there was a cleaner, there was a man that the rapist hired who came in, washed all the clothes, cleaned all the pillows, replaced all the blankets. And I urged the first detective to find this cleaner, this cleaner and ask him questions like how many times has he come to the house? Things like that, it's all in the document. And for him to say that the control phone call was the only way to move forward just makes no sense to me because it was all in the documentation that I gave him. Like the cleaner, as I, I remember when I was leaving the bathroom the cleaner instructed, put your clothes in this pile. And I said, okay. And then he washed all my clothes. It, like everything was washed by the time I left the scene of the crime. And I just don't know how as a detective, he could overlook that detail when I so blatantly wrote it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Christine, uh, my heart is with you. And I, I want you to know how powerful your testimony is. And um, I, I really thank you for coming forward and thank the chairs again for holding this hearing and giving you this opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal and thank you, Christine. Um, we will now be moving on to the testimony from the administration. Um, <clears throat> we will hear from representatives from the New York Police Department testifying for the NYPD will be Inspector Michael King. Krista Ashbury, who's the Director of Policy and Planning for the department, Oleg Chernovsky, who's the Assistant Deputy Commissioner for Legal Matters, and Michael Clark, who's the Director of Legislative Affairs for the unit. Uh, we'll be now calling on the administration to testify. Before we begin, I will administer the oath. Uh, members of the administration, I will call on each of you individually to respond. Please raise your right hands. Uh, do you firmly tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? Uh, Inspector King. I do. Director Ashbury. I do. Assistant Deputy Commissioner Chernovsky. I do. And Director Clark. I do. Thank, thank you all. You may begin. Uh, good morning. Uh, first, I would like to acknowledge the uh, testimony of uh, survivor Christine. Um, your testimony was distressing. Um, I think, I believe I did speak with an advocate regarding this case recently. And uh, moving forward after today, I will take a, another look at this case personally and uh, reach out to the advocate uh, with findings. Uh, Again, good morning, Chair Adams, Chair Diaz, and members of the council. I am Inspector Michael King, Commanding Officer of the Special Victims Division for the New York City Police Department. I am joined by Assistant Deputy Commissioner of Legal Matters, Oleg Chernavsky, Director of Policy and Planning for the Facilities Management Division, Chris Ashbury, and Director of Legislative Affairs, Michael Clark. On behalf of Police Commissioner Dermot Shea, I would like to thank you for this opportunity to discuss the New York City Police Department's investigative strategies facilities and division structure concerning sex crimes and to provide an update on our special victims division to the council. While it is indeed traumatizing to be a victim of any crime, survivors of sexual assault face a unique trauma that requires a specialized investigative process be conducted by those who investigate and prosecute these assaults. The investigators who decide to enter this field 
must possess unique qualities and a heightened sense of empathy that will allow them to interact with those who have suffered the indignity of a sexual assault. It is our responsibility to ensure that every survivor is treated with respect and compassion. I have been the commanding officer of the Special Victims Division for 13 months, and it is my specialized background as a forensic nurse, coupled with my diverse investigative background, that led to my appointment to this position by Police Commissioner Shea and Chief of Department Rodney Harrison. The Special Victims Division is responsible for investigating sex crimes and cases of child abuse. The division works in partnership with victim advocates, the five district attorney's offices citywide, nonprofits, and other city agencies to carry out its mission. Four of the city's five boroughs have a separate squad devoted solely to the investigation of sex crimes against adult victims and a separate squad dedicated to the investigation of abuse against children. In our Staten Island squad, investigators are trained to do both. In addition, the division has separate units to investigate cases that occur in the transit system, investigate cold cases, monitor registered sex offenders, and also has an analytical team dedicated to investigating drug and alcohol facilitated sexual assaults. There are currently 250 investigators assigned to the Special Victims Division, including 122 investigators assigned to the adult squads in the Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, Manhattan, and a squad located in Staten Island that investigates both child abuse and adult crimes. An additional 77 investigators are assigned to our dedicated child abuse section in the Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, and Manhattan. Moreover, 18 investigators are assigned to solely investigate sex crimes that occur in the transit system. The remainder of the personnel are assigned to investigate cold cases, monitor registered sex offenders, and analytical teams. In March of 2018, the New York City Department of Investigation reported that the department had 67 investigators assigned to the adult squads, meaning that they have increased staffing by 82% since that report was published. Investigators in the Special Victims Division are typically assigned approximately 46 cases per year, as opposed to investigators in precinct-based detective squads, who are assigned upwards of 180 cases per investigator annually. This is a 50% decrease from the levels reported in 2017 by DOI, approximately 93 cases per investigator per year. On average, investigators in a Special victim Squad may carry approximately six to eight active cases. No other police department in the country has a sex crimes unit that is comparable to the NYPD Special Victims Division in terms of size, scope, and mostly expertise. Since 2017, the department initiated repairs and renovations within Special Victims Division facilities in all five boroughs to make the environments more welcoming and survivor focused. In addition, members of our facilities team met with advocates and tour facilities in other jurisdictions to determine the correct model for what a special victims division office should look like, including co-location of the district attorney's office staff and victims advocates. It was determined that the Staten Island office could immediately be converted to fit this model, and the location was found at 137 Center Street to relocate the Manhattan Adult Squad, with work ongoing to expand and enhance that new space. However, these types of renovations were not possible at the existing locations in the Bronx, Queens, and Brooklyn. I am pleased to report that new locations have been identified in these boroughs and our facilities management division is working to ensure we can relocate as quickly as possible. These facilities will be carefully designed to align with the department's mission to uphold and strengthen the NYPD's commitment to survivors of sexual assault. In the meantime, each of the existing facilities in these three boroughs have been upgraded to the extent possible to comport with these principles. The NYPD is committed to ensuring that every detective in a special victim division has the best training to support survivors of sexual assault. We had contracted with a com company called Certified Fetty to provide trauma-informed training to all of our special victims investigators. However, an agreement could not be reached with this vendor to renew their contract, so the department was forced to seek a new provider. I am pleased to report that we have obtained a new provider, and we will be resuming our in-person trauma-informed training next month. In addition, as promised during the Police Reform and Reinvention Collaborative, we will begin conducting an annual trauma-informed refresher course for all members of the Special Victims Division. This course will begin in the spring and will ensure that Special Victims Investigators continually improve their trauma-informed interviewing technique. In addition to this training, all members of the Special Victims Division are required to complete an advanced two-week criminal investigation course 
which provides investigators with comprehensive, high quality instruction regarding the fundamental investigative process, tactics, and the importance of both physical and digital forensics. Furthermore, all new members of the Special Victim Division must complete a one-week course specifically tailored to skills that will be required for a Special Victims Division investigator. The tremendous value derived from the use of trauma-informed techniques has now led to it being incorporated into the training of all NYPD recruits, and in-service training has been and will continue to be provided to existing police officers on patrol. I'm currently working with the Training Bureau on the next round of in-service training that must be provided biennially. While I know many improvements have been made to the division over the past few years, our work is not done. I have successfully increased communication between supervisors in the Special Victims Division, subunits, and borough units. Special Victims Division executives now hold daily case management meetings with investigators and supervisors of all Special Victims Division investigative squads to discuss cases and keep everyone informed of the great work being done throughout the division. This helps prevent information silos within the Special Victims Division and improves our ability to collaborate more effectively and share information more efficiently. Moreover, squads now learn from each other and benefit from successful case resolutions conducted by other members of the division. During my 21 years of service in the police department and to the people of this city, I have heard distressing accounts from sexual assault survivors who felt they were failed by the criminal justice system. Many of these complaints centered on criticism that police officers, assistant district attorneys, and others did not make them feel like they were believed which unfortunately discouraged them from continuing with their case. It is our shared and collective goal to ensure that no survivor feels that way moving forward. These stories tend to highlight that no matter how much work we have done, there is much work that needs to be done. To that end, we continue to improve our symbiotic relationship with advocates who are currently or will be embedded in our investigative squads. Prior to the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, we worked with advocates to review special victims cases as they were able to provide valuable feedback on how we can improve our service to and relationships with survivors of sexual assault. We look forward to not only continuing, but also extending this extremely valuable partnership in the near future. Even in the absence of this review, communication with the advocates is key. One of the biggest complaints that we have received is that survivors go too long without getting an update on the case on the status of their case. That is why I have enforced the division's policy that requires investigators to reach out to survivors every 21 days. Even if there is no substantive update, it is important to make sure survivors understand what is going on and be given the opportunity to be an active participant in their investigation. We have dedicated significant resources to support survivors so that they feel believed, empowered, and encouraged to move forward with their investigation. However, we recognize there are many reasons a survivor may wish to not participate given the level of trauma involved. We now mandate that a supervisor speak to a survivor who has made the complicated decision to not continue pursuit of a criminal prosecution. This additional oversight serves to ensure that cases are not prematurely closed, that survivors do not feel pressured to make a decision to discontinue an investigation and are aware they may come back and discon I'm sorry, restart the case in the future, should their feelings and circumstances change. In addition, we provide survivors with access to an advocate to discuss their options prior to making the decision to no longer move forward with the case. There are also other notable improvements that have been made to the division, which I look forward to discussing later today. While I am confident that we put many changes in place that have vastly improved the special victim division, I know that there is more to do. To that end, as promised during the police reform and reinvention collaborative, the department has commissioned the RTI group to conduct a gap analysis of the special victim division to make recommendations for improvement. When that report is completed, the department will make it public. Thank you for this opportunity to speak with you today, and I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you so much. We'll uh, begin with Chair Diaz um, for questions. Go ahead, ma'am. Yeah, I, I thank you for recognizing me. I was considering waiting to hear all testimony in hopes that I was going to hear questions, <laughs> answers to the questions that 
I, I have before me, but unfortunately not. I, I want to thank you for, for your efforts in, in trying to um, speed up the training. And, and I know you've only been in your seat for a limited amount of months. I know COVID has probably stalled a lot of, of what seems to be thoughtful processes in moving the system along. But nonetheless, I'm faced with a, a few questions, so I'll begin my, my questioning. I'd like to know what's the difference um, in, the, in, the, in the process from today, from when you began to today. What have you specifically targeted that you can highlight for me that has been the most in fact, impactful change? Thank you for that question. Uh, so I've been here for 13 months and I have put some changes in effect. Uh, when I first became the commander of Special Victims Division, there are uh, some aspects that I looked at. Uh, I tried to see exactly what was being done across the division and I made a few changes. Uh, first of all, what I realized was that the squads, child, adult alike, citywide, really were kind of standalone. They didn't speak to each other. There wasn't enough communication. So I, I immediately implemented a daily 10 a.m. citywide conference uh, call, uh, Monday to Friday, 10 a.m., all special victims units, uh, the uh, adult squads, the child squads, and specialized squads, are, their commanders are all on this call. We discuss all the uh, important cases that are ongoing at, at that, mo that time, moment in time, uh, doing that call. Um, all, also updates are given and uh, training dates, et cetera. Uh, when I got here, I realized that investigators are really only updating their cases once every 30 days. I changed that to once every five days. In my opinion, this would allow the case investigators to be more in touch with their uh, survivors and also just with the case information documentation itself. Um, supervisors were also only required to look at cases once every 30 days. I changed that also to once every five days. Uh, this way, supervisors can sit with each investigator in their squad, go over the cases that uh, they currently have open. Uh, they can get ideas from each other, make notes in the case, and go on to next steps. Uh, the 21-day contact rule was already here before I got here. What I do is I enforce that. Um, and what, the way it was before I got here was the invest case investigators were supposed to reach out to complainants uh, once every 21 days to apprise them of what was going on with the case. Um, so what I did was I, I found that that could be improved. So I, what I added, is that not only will they reach out every 21 days, but they should also have a supervisor on the line with them when they speak to a complainant to ensure that if that complainant has an issue, uh, the supervisor can mitigate it immediately rather than waiting five, six months down the road. If the supervisor cannot mitigate the problem, then it would have to be sent up the chain to myself or my executive officer, uh, Deputy Inspector Vicky McDermott. Um, we streamlined how our squads conducted canvases for suspects. We found that to be um, lacking and deficient when we got here. Uh, we built a quality assurance program that focused on case review by pulling random cases citywide from both the child and adult squads, making known the strengths and weaknesses found in the case, and uh, sharing these findings with investigators and supervisors division-wide to encourage best practices. We also built a daily executive case management review process, which mandates that our zone captains uh, pick two squads daily and review the cases of every detective working in the squad during a particular tour via teams. So this was not being done before. I think uh, zone captains were really reading cases uh, once a month. We have them now doing this daily, uh, two squads a day with every detective that, that is working. Uh, we also uh, changed the way the division handles suspect eye cards. And uh, instead, of, instead of immediately submitting our I cards uh, based on reports, we want to make sure we speak to our complainants to make sure we have uh, all the facts relevant to the case before we uh, begin our uh, pursuit of, of anyone, uh, any particular person. We obtained a new vendor to continue to providing trauma-informed training to our investigators. We developed an internal trauma-informed course for all police academy recruits so as to enable them to actually graduate the police academy already trauma-informed in the hopes that their training will transcend to survivors of all crimes 
they encounter, but especially victims of sexual assault. Uh, we created an investigative case checklist for investigators in both the child and adult squads, respectively, to guide them through their active investigations and to also be used by supervisors prior to sign off on closed cases. We're hoping this will make our investigators more uniform in terms of everyone being on the same page. Uh, we also changed the way our C3 closings are processed. Prior to my appointment to special victims, C3 closings were handled solely by detectives and C3 closings are when our complainants want to withdraw a complaint. Uh, detectives would uh, speak to complainants and then they would uh, document that they didn't want to go forward and the case would be closed. But what we have done now is we changed that to now include a squad supervisor, must be mandated to speak to anyone who wants to close the case and apprise them of their, their options, their availability uh, for an advocate, and just to make sure they know if they want to reopen a case at any point in time, uh, that is their option to do so. Thank you. I have, um, before I go on to my next question, could you break down to me what it, you use the term ID card, and that's not one that I'm familiar with. Can you explain that to me? Uh, yes, uh, it's basically just a, uh, uh, a wanted card it is a card that we use if, if we are looking for a person in regard to a crime is a card that we establish and we send out job wide to let the everyone in the NYPD know we are looking for someone in regard to an investigation it may just be to, to speak to them maybe a witness but it's just a way for us to reach out to all our patrol officers and to let them know if you uh, meet up with this person if you stop this person this is someone we're interested in speaking to Okay, then I'd like to hear a little bit about your intake process between a stranger rape to versus acquaintance rape when someone comes in and report. Is, is there indeed a difference in how you process your cases or ID them? So a stranger case compared to uh, an acquaintance, very yes. different variables uh, because uh, obviously the, the acquaintance is known. So that is a different ID process. In a stranger case, it, we need some more legwork in terms of going out to get video, canvassing, uh, speaking to people, uh, businesses, neighbors, et cetera. Um, that does take uh, uh, a lot more uh, investigations, uh, boots on the ground, as compared to someone who the complainant already knows. Okay, I definitely see some plus some faces among my, my colleagues are puzzled. I see a lot of puzzle. So I, I'm sure we're gonna have some deep questions for you moving forward. I'd like to speed up in reference to your, your training of, of your officers. What, to what if, if you can share to this, how was someone selected to be part of, of your unit? So uh, anyone who's interested in becoming a part of the Special Victim Division, they would have to fill out our application that is specific to SVD. Um, that application would then be uh, taken in by our internal staff. It is reviewed and an uh, interview will be set up for that person. And that person will be interviewed by an executive in special victims. And we would look at their history in the department, their disciplinary history. Uh, we also look at what they did prior to becoming a New York City police officer. We look at their activity uh, during our interview, we, we, we do a writing sample. We also have them uh, speak on what they believe the mission of uh, SVD is. And we kind of get a feel for the temperament of this person to see if they would be a good fit for the mission that we're trying to accomplish here. Okay. Then in reference to your training, when it, um, other than detectives, who else receives training for, on how to deal with a sexual assault case? Uh, that is everyone assigned to the special victims uh, division, whether they are a white shield police officer or they're a regular detective, supervisors, we all executives, everyone in special victims has to take the same training. Okay, so I, I Darmy Diaz, walk in to report a case. I walk into the report room. Is there anyone there at the moment I mentioned I've been raped, I've been assaulted, can easily identify what could be my triggers and move me into a place where I could be confined and not be exposed to say 30 people in the vicinity that would have no idea how to, how to treat me. 
So if uh, a complainant walks into uh, a precinct or any other police facility yes. and they would like to report that they are a victim of sexual assault, then as soon as the report taker uh, comprehends that, they would reach out to special victims. And if we, don't, if we do not have an office in that particular uh, command, such as the one twelve precinct would have Queen special victims upstairs, then they would reach out to us and we would send uh, special victims investigators to pick that person up and bring them back to our survivor friendly location. Okay, so I want to understand that there is no uniform conversation throughout the department that would address this. If someone yeah, walks in, you, you, you have to be either a senior officer or would have to be part of the unit to be able to identify how to treat an individual when they're first. No, 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 not at all. Um, they, 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 every police officer is trained on how to take a report from a special victim uh, in the field. Yes, what, what I'm saying is after that initial interview by that officer, oh. Okay. They would reach out to us and have us conduct an in-depth interview. Okay. Then my final question before I turn it over to my colleagues, um, gender-based training. Do you have gender-specific training, buzzwords, what to look for, one gender versus another gender? Are, are, are we sensitive in the training process? Yes, so that is addressed in our special victims course, which is built just for special victims investigators. And then we also carry on, carry that uh, over and further into our trauma informed course, which again is mainly for our special victims investigators. Okay. Thank you for answering my questions. If I have more, I'll come back. Thank you. Turn it back over to council for any members that have to have questions at this time. Uh, thank you, Chair Diaz. Um, we'll now turn to Chair Adams, followed by Councilmember Rose. Um, any other council members who would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Uh, good morning, Inspector. Thank you uh, for your testimony thus far. Um, I, I've got a couple of questions for you. Um, you mentioned that uh, Special Victims Division training ceased because the vendor terminated the contract. When exactly did that happen? Uh, good morning. I was appointed uh, in August of last year. And when I came in to this position, uh, this was already ongoing. I don't know at what time the vendor uh, had tried to renegotiate the contract. But when I got here in August of last year, um, this was already ongoing with our management and budget team. And at that time, I was informed that the vendor uh, could not come to terms with the, the, the city's Appendix A. And, and at that point, uh, we were forced to then find a new vendor. And it, it was uh, sometime early last year that this happened. All right, early, nine, early 2019. I think it was early, I'll find out the exact date, but I thought it was early or late 2019, early 2020. Okay. That this, these negotiations were ongoing. And that was the termination. So when was a new uh, vendor agreed upon and uh, a new contract enacted? So um, I myself, being a forensic nurse, I, ha I had already taught trauma-informed. I immediately identified a vendor. Uh, but because of the new onboarding process, it took a, a few months to get them on board. So I would say in this past summer, everything was completed. And we have the courses starting next month. We have 104 investigators who are left to be trauma informed. So they will all be trained between mid November to early December. So that's an extreme lapse uh, in training. How many did you say? 104? Right. There were 213 already trained under the old contract, and we had 104 remaining. Uh, and those 104 are now going to be trained by the new vendor. How long had those 104 been operating without this training? Uh, there were 56, I guess, operating for, I guess, about a year. And we have uh, the remainder are fairly new to special victims, maybe three, three to four months that they have been here. But they, but they are not, they have never uh, been allowed to uh, interview 
complainants by themselves. They are always with someone who has previous trauma-informed training. All right, so it's pretty much the buddy system when it comes to interviewing traumatized rape victims and, and such. So, okay. Um, the report actually indicated that training stopped because of COVID. Are you aware of that? That is what I was told, yes. Why is that? It, why, it would, stopped. why would the report say that it was because of COVID, yet we know that it was because of vendor termination? It began in March of 2020 because of COVID. Uh, the in-person training had been suspended throughout the department during the, the height of the, the COVID epidemic. Uh, it was during this time that the, the contract issues began as well. Um, and so the training had ceased because of COVID and then the contract, we had contract issues, which we have now replaced the vendor and we will continue with the rest, uh, later this year. Right, that, that raises a red flag for me as well. Uh, let, let's, go, let's go back to Christine's testimony, very disturbing testimony. Uh, it's distressing for me to know that it took her to testify here this morning with us for, for you to say something um, that you're gonna personally pick this case up. That's distressing to me also. So we've got a, a, a list here of just problematic behavior, problematic interaction, problematic relationship um, between this division and the survivors. Um, I, I said when I spoke with her that she was in essence her own detective. How in heaven's name can we allow a survivor to pick up her own case, track her own case, offer her own evidence, spend her own money, and then the, this division comes back and pretty much slaps her back in the face again. Sorry, Christine, for, for saying that, but, but traumatizes her even more and victimizes her even more by closing her case without ever informing her of anything. It seems to me that she this case upon herself after her rape and then had to take herself through steps to try to remedy this situation that should have been remedied by the folks that were sworn to protect her. She testified that she had to push her own case forward. Why is this acceptable for this division? Is there no follow-up for survivors? I just wanna know the procedure for interacting with survivors when complaints don't result in an arrest. When complaints result in an arrest, uh, the case investigation- When they don't result in an arrest, what are the procedures? She, she's her own detective right now. What, what are your procedures? When, when, this, when a case like this does not result in an arrest? Uh, if the case is closed due to certain variables uh, that are, we're not able to establish a probable cause case, and we sit down with our assistant district attorneys who are also partners in the case, we discuss the case with the supervisor and the ABA and the uh, case investigator. And if, if it is determined that an arrest cannot be made, then the complainant is informed as to why, and then the case is closed. It didn't happen in this case though. Uh, this case, uh, council member, I will have to personally sit down and look at it because I do not know all of the variables that are attached to this case. All right, I'm giving you a heavy, heavy exhale right now because I've got to regroup myself right now. Um, okay. So let's, let's talk a little bit about compliance with the law, the package of uh, legislation brought forth by this council in 2018 regarding all of this, really. Uh, Local Law 189, which my colleague, Councilmember Rosenthal, referenced at the top of her remarks this morning that have to do with sensitivity training. Um, it seems right now that we have uh, a number of, of detectives who have been trained um, including, I'd like to know, including the detectives that worked Christine's case, were they trained in sensitivity training and compliance with Local Law 189? Uh, Councilmember, you broke up a little bit there. Can you repeat the I'm question? I'm sorry. I, yeah, I apologize. I was asking whether or not the detectives involved in Christine's case were uh, received sensitivity training in compliance with Local Law 189. So I think there are two training laws that were passed. There's Local 1, 189, which is sensitivity training. And that was sort of 
department wide, and then there's a specific SVD um, training that was, you know, more intensive. Um, in terms of this, the local 189, the, the department wide training that called for in person training for recruits. Um, since that law passed, we've had several um, modules that address it and from various aspects, uh, including uh, a module that's dedicated specifically to the LBGTQIA community. Um, but then there's also requires biannual training of all officers on the job on sensitivity training. And to that end, we did do a command level training in the first biannual training. And then we did an NYPDU video with the required quiz that all officers were required to take. We are now in the second biannual um, cycle. Uh, it began at the in May of 2019. Uh, Inspector King is actually working with our training bureau on creating a new um, trainings for all in service to detectives and for a new and, and upgrading the training for our in group trainers. That's separate from the sort of SVD trauma informed training, um, which all SVD detectives have gotten some training. They've gotten the, the two week CIC course and the one week SVD course. That's but on top of that, there was trauma informed training. That's the, the subject of the contract. Um, I'm not sure, I don't know if Inspector King knows without seeing which detectives were, whether they had it, um, but it's certainly something I believe he'll look into. Yes, definitely. I, I hope that's the case, because my question was whether or not her detectives actually did receive this training. If, it, if they did, it doesn't sound like, like it took, um, or that they uh, really, um, yeah, I'll just leave it there, it doesn't sound like it took at all, it, especially the second detective, even more troubling that it was a woman who pretty much just said, I don't know what to do with this. That's that's what I heard. I don't know what you heard, but I heard a detective tell a survivor that I don't know what to do right now. So pretty much I'm, I'm just, you know, giving you, you know, no more thought. That is unacceptable and cannot happen. Cannot, cannot. Um, now, uh, Inspector King, you, you, you told me that you didn't know the details of Christine's case, but you did say that you spoke with an advocate on the case. Which one is it? Uh, meaning, Council Member, that I have not read the case. I spoke with the NEB regarding uh, the overall information, but I have not read the case itself. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to uh, let it go to my colleagues at this point, um, just to, again, give myself a chance to breathe through my frustration in this hearing. So thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, I will reserve the right to come back for another round. Thank you, Chair Adams. Um, bear with me for a second. Um, we'd like to acknowledge uh, Majority Leader Cumbo has joined us. Um, for questions, we will now turn to Council Member Rose, followed by Rosenthal, followed by Council Member Holden. Uh, Council Member Rose, you may begin. Starting time. Thank you. Um, Inspector King, uh, based on your, your remarks, uh, your statement, it seems that there's some training and efforts that are, are made to encourage a victim to pursue a case and not close it. It sounds as if there are efforts made to um, give them all the support they need if in fact they are, are leaning toward not pursuing a case. But what happens when um, they do? What is your standard operating procedure for a victim that wants to pursue a case? And what level of evidentiary in information is needed to proceed with an active investigation? And, um, and what standard needs to be met um, for a case to move forward? Well, thank you for your question. Once we have a complainant uh, and we conduct an interview, and we establish the parameters of the crime that has been committed, then the investigative process will move forward with, if it is a stranger case, trying to identify the person responsible. If it is an acquaintance, we go into a background check. Uh, we may do a controlled phone call. We will uh, speak to, uh, we will provide services to our complainant, uh, our survivor, um, which in involves an advocate. Uh, we will also speak to the assistant district attorney uh, in whatever borough that this case is in. Uh, if probable cause is obtained, 
then we would move forward with making an arrest. What, uh, and, and that's, that's my, my question really is, is um, probable cause. You know, what level of evidentiary information do you have to have to proceed forward? As in, um, in Christine's case, um, it seems as if, uh, you know, she, she made available as much information as she could. Um, and and it, it did not move forward. So um, what is the standard that has to be met for a case to move forward before um, you uh, uh, close a case? You know, what precipitates closing a case? Uh, there, again, every case is different and every case is unique. No two cases are alike um, in terms of the probable cause. A lot of our cases are difficult. We, we have a very, again, that is why we are a special victim division. Our cases compared to other uh, units are very different. Um, in terms of uh, sexual assault and trying to get our information for probable cause, uh, many, a lot of cases come down to, we have a complainant, uh, and we have a person of interest with different uh, degrees or explanations of what happened. Um, in terms of forensic evidence, uh, let us say you have a burglary and you get DNA fingerprints of a foreign person being in that home. That is very different than getting the same forensic evidence in a special victim's case. So, and I just want to say, I don't want to be very graphic. If we have a complainant saying she, he's assaulted by another person, in a room. Now we find forensics in the room. We find uh, semen on a bed sheet, et cetera. Uh, is this enough for probable cause? Uh, really finding that evidence uh, will indicate that sexual activity occurred. It does not indicate force was used. So we have to dive further into the investigation. Yes, we speak to our complainants, we conduct an in-depth trauma-informed interview. The, tra the, the uh, control call is very, very important because again, having forensic evidence in a burglar or robbery is very different in a sexual assault case. So let's say this is not a stranger case. These, these are people who are known to each other. Again, in a closed room with no witnesses, no video, we have party A saying something happened and party B may be disputing that. Um, the control call is what we depend on in something like that because we're hoping party B may make a disclosure that yes, force was used. Uh, yes, I did hear you say no, something okay. to, to that effect. That okay, is just um, I'm sorry, my, my time is about ready to run out. And I have, I just want to ask you this why are there so many closed, unsolved SV cases? What what is what do you attribute I'm that? Expired. What do you attribute that to? Why we have so many closed, unsolved SV cases? Uh, many of our cases are closed due to either uh, the complainant maybe not want to go forward, or us not being able to uh, prove that force was used in the case. Um, again, it comes down to a lot of different variables with the cases. It is very difficult to pinpoint just one reason why so many cases go unsolved. We also have cases where uh, our persons of interest have fled the country or fled the jurisdiction. We're, we're unable to apprehend them. The case is not closed permanently, but closed until we maybe have found that person. So again, there are a lot of different variables that go into why cases close. But again, being that no two cases are alike, is very difficult just to pinpoint one, but those are a few of the reasons why. Um, my time is up. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Burroughs. We'll now turn to Councilman Rosenthal, followed by Councilmember Holden. Starting time. Uh, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Chairs. Uh, thank you um, to the Committee Council for their help. Um, Deputy Inspector King, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your efforts over the last 13 months. You know, it's interesting. I'm reading your testimony. I'm hearing you. The systems you're describing sound amazing. 
but how do you explain what went wrong in Christine's case? And further, from my understanding and speaking with the advocates who work with survivors every day, Christine's case is not an outlier. So where's the disconnect? Uh, thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal, great question. Um, you know, it is difficult to pinpoint, again, with the cases, uh, the interaction with investigators and complainants, survivors, um, to give you one reason why there's a disconnect. Uh, everyone receives a trauma-informed training and it is used by each investigator differently. Uh, again, it comes down to their understanding of it. It comes down to their, their, use, their use of the, the training when they interact with, with a survivor. So to say some are more successful than others using the technique, that, that is true as to why some members may not, as, may not be as successful as others. Uh, that would take a, a whole different um, analysis that I really would not have at this point. The trauma is form RTI does, does work. Into that? Is that one of the things RTI is studying? I, I do believe so. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. What were you saying? Yes, I, I do. I do believe RTI. That is one aspect that they're looking at. But yeah. as I was saying before, in terms of trauma informed, all investigators are. Um, in terms of how they each individually use it, again, it just comes down to the person and how they are able to uh, convey that training into a real life scenario. And, and I do think some of the increased oversight, you know, is re relatively recently added by Inspector King, and you know, the the hope and the goal is. That, that increased oversight will limit, you know, survivors who feel this way, who have been treated this way, um, and that we can be better on top of it. So, some of these more recent innovations hopefully will bear fruit going forward, uh, which may not have had the same uh, effect going backwards. I you do. I do. Uh, the, 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 Sorry. The refresher, the refresher trauma informed course that was not happening before that will be happening annually. Uh, because now, if we have a, an investigator who goes through trauma informed, let's say four years ago, that was just one initial course. He took the basic course. Now, what we believe will reinforce that is having every special victims investigator go through a refresher trauma informed course every year to reinforce that basic training. Yeah, that sounds great. I'm I'm looking at the report online about. Um, the training that occurred in 2020. Uh, it looks like in total there was attendance um, by uh, some people. Um, there are eight. There were eight attendees at the criminal investigations course. None at the special victims investigators course. Eight at the trauma-informed interviewing, and it actually shows 49 for attendance at the FETI. And then when I look at the specific courses, which I appreciate so much you're laying out, the courses themselves, for example, I'm just looking at the criminal investigators course, it looks like for all of them, and there are about 47, each one is about an hour or two, that the course itself is, and there are details about what the objectives are for each course, but the course is a PowerPoint presentation, a lecture, and uh, it does say interactive participation, discussions, question and answer. Why would it not be possible to do that over Zoom? Uh, we're doing a lot in our lives over Zoom. I'm expired. May I continue, chairs? Yes. Uh, so to, to your, your question, um, I cannot speak as to why the training bureau did not do that when I got here in uh, No, August. this is the 2020 report. 
the 2020, right. Uh, and, and you're referring to our criminal investigations course as to why that could not be done over Zoom? Look at, frankly, that was one I just said out loud. I mean, the SVD, uh, the SVD investigators course, similarly, all PowerPoint lecture, discussion, question and answer, uh, FETI course, uh, same, same, all PowerPoint trauma-informed interview course, uh, PowerPoint presentation lecture, interactive discussion. Uh, I've read one of the manuals on trauma-informed interviewing, and, you know, it's pretty, uh, you know, you have to read it, but it's fairly straightforward. I'm just not hearing that any of that has sunk in, nor am I seeing on the attendance page that very many of your 226 uh, staff t attend the courses. And I'm just thinking, well, COVID, yes, but gosh, uh, so much is done by Zoom. I don't understand why this wouldn't be done over Zoom. These are, I, I, that's an, I, I'm having trouble squaring that. So uh, that is a great point you bring up, Councilmember Rosenthal. Um, I, I think the problem here for me to answer that is that uh, the training, when training occurs, we are notified. The spe even the Special Victims Course does not belong to us. It is the tr Detective Bureau Training Unit. Um, so I do not know why they don't do certain trains over Zoom. That is something I'd have to get that so, answer and reach out to I'm you. sorry, and I, I appreciate you so much. Do you get a report from that unit about how many of the uh, White Shields, police officers, detectives in your unit get training? Do you yes, know I, whether or I, not? I do get that, that report. So you do know whether or not they get training? Uh, when they, yes, when whenever training is given, we are uh, advised and we yeah. send them names of who will attend. Uh-huh, great. And so I, I, I would be, so how, so do you realize that of your 20, 226 uh, staff that, that, very few get, do, do, are you, do you look at that? Like over a course of a year, do you have some sort of dashboard that tells you these many, here are the names of the people who got trained, here are all the names of the people in your division, they've not received this training. I mean, this was required under law to be annual, uh, although one of the lawyers on the team here can tell me if I'm wrong, but, this is annual training. What, what, I, what I can tell you, uh, Councilman Rosenthal, is that uh, when I got here in August, there were 213 members who were already uh, trauma-informed trained. And there you were- You told that or you know that? I'm sorry. It is documented in the Special Victims Division that 213 members worked FEDI trained. And when the contract, uh, uh, ended, there were 104 that were left over, and they were in limbo until we were now able to get this new vendor, and they will all be trained by the first week in December. And I, I believe that the law was a, it was a training requirement prior to interviewing uh, survivors on your own. Um, so the eight what we're seeing is it doesn't include the people who had been trained in prior years to it, but doesn't mean that the annual training isn't worth it. And you're, and you're right, we should be doing annual training, which is why we're now adding it in. Um, and it was part of the- here, Let me hear what you said again. This will it now will, be annual? It will now be an annual training. Um, it won't be the same as the introductory training that investors get, investigators get. It will be a refresher and sort of more of an advanced training. Um, introductory is the wrong word, but like it'll be different yeah. than the training they get before they get in. Um, and, but in an annual only, training- Thank you. And that only replies in, uh, refers to FETI. How about the trauma-informed interviewing course? No, that, that is what uh, we're trying to say, Councilmember Rosenthal, that we are going to be doing starting next year an annual trauma-informed refresher course. So, we, so our members who already did FETI or trauma-informed from a year or two or three years ago, every year they will be required 
to go through a trauma informed refreshment. Right, and, and of course they're different, right? Well, you have the initial trauma informed course, and the refresher will go over the points that were made in that initial training. Well, of course, one has to do with evidence, forensic evidence, and the other has to do with the interaction, right? Correct. Okay, so they're two separate sets. I mean, they're listed on the NYPD report as two separate sets of coursework, separate from SVD investigators course, separate from criminal investigation course. They're all separate. So will, and I think in total, there might be something like, I would be making it up 60 courses all together combined. So are you saying each of the 60 will be annual? So I don't think so. No, no, trauma. Yeah, it'll be a trauma. So the criminal investigator course is part of the training that all investigators receive. But that is that that CIC course is also it's broader than SVD. So you know there, there are topics there that aren't necessarily relevant to an SVD investigator, or there's topics relevant to every detective. How then there's the, the SVD, SVD investigator course. Will that be done annually? Yes, uh, we, we already had an SVD investigator course earlier this year. We have one starting today for five days. That is separate from the trauma informed. Yeah. Yes, that's right. So will that be done annually going forward? Uh, yes, yes, that should be done annually. This is, today starts the second one for this year. Okay, the second because you stagger people attending. Correct. Right, Correct. but... So, so that course, just sort of to be clear, that was not offered in 2020, but, uh, it, but yes, so, in 2021. So to, in 2021, this, today makes the second offering of that course. 2020, I got here in August. I don't know what happened before I got here. Regarding that for course. the most part, it, it, it was other, I mean, other maybe it said zero than, than it wasn't, um, but it would have been, it yeah. would have been offered later in the year. It just, when in March, when we shut down in-person training for COVID, I understand the Zoom question, we can reach out to the training. I, I think a lot of these trainings are better in person um, if, you can, if you can safely do it, but um, we can look into why we didn't have a Zoom version, okay. of course. I'm, I'm gonna move on just very quickly. Uh, for all the new staff brought on board to SVD, do all of them, intentionally apply or is it ever the case that someone's transferred over with no application you know sort of like hey could you take this person does that ever happen so a uh, very good question um we submit a list of people that we would like to bring to the division and of course uh others who are not on the list sometimes get transferred in yes and and why would somebody be transferred in that, uh, Julie, you sort just... of like someone who's transferred in, given, as you said, the SVD being so unique and challenging and nuanced, do you give them special, you know, do you want make sure that they want to be there because it's so hard? Uh, so the transfer process uh, usually is at the discretion at a level above special victims division. Okay. Um, All right. So that, that, that is why that happens. Great. What changes have you made so that getting video evidence is happening within a week? And how are you tracking that? So whenever a case is brought into the uh, division, our investigators are told to immediately respond to look for video because video is such a fragile and fleeting aspect of the investigation. So that is something that has to be done immediately. I mean, Say given it. that it didn't happen with Christine, do you, how do you track that to know that it's happening? Uh, again, that, that is why I created the, uh, the checklist to make sure our investigators are being guided by that list um, to make, so that they can see when they pick up the checklist, video is one of the immediate things they have to go for. Uh, in, in Christine's case, I would have to look at the case to see what happened 
regarding that. If, if that was a deficient a deficiency, I'd have to look into that. Wow. I mean, that sounds like really an important thing to do, given that strikes me that the emphasis seems to be on the controlled call, not necessarily on the video evidence and the, the controlled call. And the controlled call, it almost sounds like, I, I don't know, it's, it's, sounds very traumatic for the survivor while getting a video seems pretty straightforward and easy. It sounds like bars keep this information for a week. So gosh, if a survivor heads into the hospital and SVD is there on site when the forensic exam is happening, why wouldn't you get that video within 24 hours, right? Can you, do you track how many times the video is is gotten? Uh, we don't have a, a tracking sheet per se. Uh, our squad commanders are the ones who are making sure that it's done. Uh, and also video, uh, let's say video of a bar showing a, a, a complainant with a person of interest. The video will show us that, yes, they were both present. If the attack didn't happen in the bar, then the only thing that the only probative value of the video is to show us that both people were present at one location. Sure. I mean, it's something, right? You don't want to not get it, right? No, it is. It is. Thank Absolutely. Council Member okay. Rosenthal, Last question. excellent questions. We know we can go on, but we have other members, and I'm sure. told Thank we have you. 20. I'll get them on. Thank you, Council Please, Member. Yes. I'll get it on the second round. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sure we'll do a third round. I'm not sure who's up next. Okay, thank you, Member. Thank you, Chair Chair Diaz. Um, next is Councilmember Holden, followed by Councilmember Miller. Go ahead, Councilmember Holden. Thank you. Starting time. Well, uh, what a what a very very important hearing this is, and I thank the chairs, and I thank certainly um, um, the inspector for his testimony, and also Christine. I, I by the way, I'm, I apologize if I ask a question that was asked or that um, was stated because I was on another hearing, and I. Got, I got kind of the tail end of Christine's testimony, which was very disturbing. Um, so let me ask Inspector, th there are 236 detectives in, or slash investigators in the SVD? Uh, I think approximately 255 right 255. now. Okay. Could you give me a breakdown of male detectives and investigators versus female detectives and investigators? Give me a second. I think I may have that information. I think at this time we have 113 females and 172 males. Yeah, that's that's problem number one. Um, there should be many more female detectives, obviously, and there should be active recruiting. I, I, I suppose you are recruiting female detectives for the unit. That is correct. I mean, I would, you know, just to tell you flat out that that number should be, there should be 200 female detectives in that unit or more um, because they can, obviously they can empathize with the, um, the victim. They, they're, they're, sensitive, they're more sensitive to the issues, I would think. Um, I, it's not automatic all the time, but I would say that's a good place to start. And I would identify even recruits in the academy, people that you feel have the ability in that unit. Um, so I would identify detectives or investigators very early on. Um, and, and another thing that was kind of disturbing, and I hear this, I hear this even in the precinct level, I hear this from police officers that should never say this to a victim or should never say this to a complainant that uh, I'm working on another case or something, it's, I'm too busy working on another case or that's a little, you know, that's more important than yours or that's, um, that, that I happen to be, it's a big case. You should never say that. And uh, any detective that said that should not be working in that unit or should not be working as a detective. If they're gonna say to any victim that this is more important, that's what's taking my time. Would you agree? I agree wholeheartedly, sir. So, so there's, there's a lack, so we get a lack of training, a lack of empathy here. 
Um, and I, I see this, by the way, I don't, not only in the, in the SVD, I see it, but like I said, I've been working with police department, uh, you know, for over 35 years in, in my local precinct. And I've seen, and again, detectives, police officers are human beings and they make mistakes, but there's got to be a level in, on the job that you just don't say certain things and that you have to show that you care um, and that you have to do your job. Um, just the idea with the video, I had the same exact experience in a local precinct where uh, a senior was hit by a car. Um, the, the police reported that he wasn't hit. The family was saying he was hit by a car. Uh, I said, let's get the video. And nobody got the video in the precinct. And they just closed the case and said he wasn't hit by a car. Well, guess what? My staff had to go get the video. And the, the video showed plain plain and simple, that he was hit by the car. And this is the case that I'm seeing over and over again. So I believe, Christine, I believe that all that this can happen because it's happened to us. So let me let me just ask you, Inspector, you were quoted in a news article of an exchange with Chief Harrison uh, early this month. And according to the article, you said it is hard to get these detectives, meaning in the Special Victims Unit, to document properly and write down what they should. You found that out. Is that true? That is that article true? Uh, so the, the article did not display the dynamic uh, exchange, I think, correctly. Um, what I was trying to state, not, when I said these detectives, not meaning special victims, meaning detectives uh, job-wide, and not every detective. There is a small percentage of uh, uh, investigators who we feel may not document cases to the standard that we would like. But again, like you said, uh, that could be anywhere and, and anyone, but I was not referring to special victim detectives only. I meant to say that job-wide in, in, in both private sector and public sector, we have documentation issues that, that are, uh, you know, uh, traverse the, the entire spectrum of- Time expired. So, yeah, so, it's uh, not, so it's not necessarily, or special victims division um, does document properly or they're also- yeah, I, Yes, I, I, I want to say to you, sir, that uh, that conversation was, was regarding one worksheet in one case out of 10,000. So I don't want it to seem that the special victim division has a, a uh, problem that, that spans the entire division. That was one worksheet in one case. Well, if you listen, you listen to Christine's uh, testimony, her story, I mean, is what, that, that should not happen. And, it, you know, if, uh, again, when you investigate, you know, her, her issue, obviously her, her ordeal, um, I think you might find that uh, some detectives dropped the ball here um, and on many levels. So I think we need to have some oversight uh, within a department to make sure that we're getting the right people for the right job and they document everything and they follow through on, like you're, you said, you have a checklist and then somebody has to check that list to make sure that they've, uh, they've looked at it. So their supervisors should be looking at the checklist and then go and then also interviewing or calling the victim to make sure that everything was done properly. So this this what happened to Christine does not happen again. Thank you, thank you, chairs. I, I guess the inspector doesn't have an answer for that one. Thank you. I, I, before we go over, um, thank you, Councilman Holder, for bringing that up. And I don't want to lose my thought in the process and ask a follow up question. Am I, is it? Okay for me to understand that the detectives dealing with special victims are on point, documentation is in order, you do not have a communication issue with, with those under you, it's a clear slate, everything is in order, the media caption was nowhere near the truth? No, uh, uh, like, like I stated uh, before, are you, am I saying every detective in every case is perfect? No, that's not what I'm saying. Uh, in regard to the Comstat exchange, what we were speaking about was uh, one case and one report, one basically one sheet of paper. Again, the Special Victims Division generates thousands of worksheets, we call DB5s, every day. This was one worksheet out of thousands that one chief found deficient, and we spoke about that issue but it was not indicative of the documentation that is going on across the Special Victims Division. So to this one particular case, 
which me being a survivor of domestic violence, one is one too many. To that point, what have you done to rectify this particular case to ensure that the victims indeed, it was identified and dealt with based on, on, on the needs? Was there an so, arrest made? Did you, were you able to fix the situation? So, so that, that's a great question. Uh, and let me explain exactly what, what happened here. We had a complainant who stated someone uh, in her building who was known to her touched her uh, in, inappropriately. Um, she came in, she gave her statement. Uh, the person was identified. We wanted to proceed with the case, but the uh, complainant stated that the person who committed the crime was moving out of the building and she did not feel the need to go forward with the case. Um, at that point, she stated she wanted to not go forward. So we gave her our C3 form, which she signed. So the, the, the complaint in this case had no problem with special victim. What, what happened was the way that the, the, the uh, worksheet was documented in terms of the statement was taken from the complainant. And then right after that, she was given the C3 form only because she had stated in, at the end of her initial statement, she said, this is what happened, but because he's moving out, I don't want to go forward. And the detective then gave her the form. What uh, Comstat, uh, one chief had a problem was he felt that the documentation did not show that the complainant of her own volition said, hey, I don't want to go forward. They said the way the, the sheet was written, the DD5 was written, made it appear that maybe we gave her the form too quickly, which was which is not true. She gave a statement. At the end of the statement, she said, I don't want to go forward. He's moving out. And it's my right not to go forward. The supervisor was advised, again, my, my new C3 process, the supervisor was advised immediately. He sat and spoke with her at length, at which time she said, I still don't want to go forward. I still want to sign the form, which she did. And, and she left. But again, the only issue with that case was the chief felt that it should have been documented to say the complainant of her own volition said, I don't want to go forward. That, that's what happened with that one case. And, and I would like to say that in response to that, we are also having everyone in the special victims division, you know, just redo a training on documentation, you know, as if everyone's like you said, there's obviously, we can't say that we, everyone is perfect and no one could use a refresher. So we're going to have everyone retrained on proper documentation, um, in addition to the checklists and the, the supervised extra supervision that Inspector King has instituted in the division. And in essence of, of time, and I want to be courteous to, to the, the members that are going to speak and the, the 24 or 25 others that we have listed, I would close my, my statement right now with just saying the words maybe and feeling don't fall right in this process. Your professionals, you've chosen this line of work, chosen to be part of this department, is that I feel I should have done this. If there's a manual, let's follow the manual. It's maybe we could have closed it differently. No. Moving forward, I would kindly ask you to strike from using those words because it's somewhat insulting to think we have to feel to do this. It should be, it is, it is, it's black and white. Um, thank you. Turning it over to, to council. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Diaz. Um, we'll move on to uh, Councilmember Miller, um, and we'll after that we'll follow back up to Chair Adams for a second round of questions. Uh, go ahead, uh, Councilmember Miller. Starting time. Thank you. Good morning uh, to the chairs. Uh, important hearing here. I'm also I'm, I'm so very grateful uh, to see that uh, my colleagues are on the same page when it comes to oversight and accountability here. Uh, the council member holding the fire, uh, and also succinct with the, with the members of the women's caucus and all. We see that, uh, accountability is, is vitally important. And I would just ask that, you know, we all pick up the phone and, and hear that this call is being recorded for training purposes. And so we should be, uh, reviewing these cases, including, uh, any discourse or dialogue that has occurred to make sure that it is, uh, 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 properly uh, adhering to whatever uh, rules, regulations that are currently in place. So that would be a question to ensure that, that 
um, this this review of the discourse uh, is consistent with the policy. Number one, and then secondly, um, are, are we finding that there are particularly uh, or, or maybe disproportionate reporting or managing of of, of cases uh, by the unit when it comes to uh, communities of color? Uh, considering the relationships with communities of color and, and the department, uh, are, does the data support that they are underreported or reported at the same level of, 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 of uh, communities of non communities of, of color as well? So, if I'm understanding your question correctly, I'm sorry you, you uh, toned out there in the end. Um, in regard to the demographics of our complainants, um, is that something I track? Uh, I do not have that information in front of me. Uh, we take reports from anyone who believes they were a victim of sexual assault, regardless of uh, demographic. So that is not something that I feel uh, we have any dis dis uh, deficiencies in. Like I said, anyone who reports a sexual assault is treated the same. Uh, the investigation will be carried out. So, but in regard to the demographics, I do not have that in front of me. Yeah, I, I think so, council member, if you, if you take a look, we have a uh, report that we post annually on our website uh, that both talks about the demographics of the individual arrested for particular crimes and the demographics of victims. When you take a look at sex crimes, whether it be felony or misdemeanor, uh, no matter what the overall number of reported crimes are in a given year, the constant is, is that about three quarters of victims are uh, black and Hispanic. And, 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 and that is obviously important data when, when we look at that. And, and, and um, is that based on, on, on your experiences, is, is that representative of the, is, are, are those reported cases represented of the actual differences that may uh, occur within those communities of color? And then we find that there is some some form of historic disconnect based on our uh, relationship with the department. And then there been in particular- yeah, Council member, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt, but your your mic is going in and out. So it's it's a little hard to hear the question. And, and, and has, has, has there, does the data support does the data support uh based on the fact that 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 three quarters uh 75 percent of of the victims are, are, are black and latino or can come from communities of color um there's further obviously that would mean that there should be uh further resources or uh, uh, made available to ensure that we're doing something to either keep communities safe to ensure that uh, reporting that we're not missing something uh, within that there are gaps uh, within the cracks that that these crimes that are obviously prevalent within these communities are not being underreported uh, based on some of the training that was that this council member um, Rosen uh, expressed who was in attendance uh, but is there a particular outreach for these communities so not just that we're reporting and that that the unit is uh, 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 responding correctly and aggressively, but that we're working towards uh, mitigation and prevention, particularly uh, based on the data that, that, that we've uh, gotten from this community. Uh, I'm going to try to address that. It's very difficult to hear you, uh, Council Member. Um, I just want to let you know that the Special Victims Division does have a liaison unit that prior to COVID, did a lot of in-person outreach. I'm expired. Citywide um, in every borough. They went to clinics, they went to hospitals, they went to, to schools and colleges uh, to let everyone know regarding the reporting um, opportunities that we have set forth in special victims in the department uh, to, to report special victims, no matter what community uh, you may reside in. Um, that is something that we are, we are hoping to again, move forward into the community, doing that again. But prior to uh, COVID and the restrictions that were in place, we were doing that citywide in, uh, in, in, in every borough. And, and are they working with CBOs and organizations within these communities of color specifically to get the word out? And, 
in the partnership. Are, did you say are they working with CBOs? Organization. Organization. Oh, uh, yes, yes. I have a training sergeant, uh, Pearl Poon. She is uh, always speaking with uh, community uh, partnerships in regard to getting the word out. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you, Councilmember Miller. Um, we'll all turn to Councilmember Adams to do a second round, followed by Chair Diaz as well, and then back to Councilmember Rosenthal. Um, go ahead, Chair Adams. Thank you, uh, Council. I'm going to be brief. Um, Inspector, you're providing sensitivity training to recruits at the academy, but in too many cases, it doesn't seem to be sticking. Um, do you review complaints by survivors regarding poor treatment by detectives? Is there some kind of eternal evaluation in place um, to track whether certain detectives get more complaints or others? And uh, if so, how do those complaints stack up against other divisions? So uh, my integrity control officer tracks uh, complaints. Um, I have to say, since I've been here in, since August of last year, I've only had maybe, maybe uh, three or four complaints that were brought to me directly um, that were reported through, through our internal affairs or uh, through uh, CCRB in terms of uh, treatment. Uh, advocates have, have also brought it to my attention certain issues, but I always address them immediately. Okay, that was my question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair Diaz. Hi, I am going to allow my three minutes to go over to Councilwoman Rosenthal and I'm doing so specifically because unfortunately often panelists will move and advocates, which advocates actually mean survivors, will not get to address the administration directly. Councilman Rosenthal, you have three minutes. Great, thank you so much, okay. Councilmember Diaz. Just real quickly, um, I'm wondering uh, who is responsible for distributing the survivor rights information sheet that I asked about and what support is given to a survivor before and after a controlled call is an advocate with the survivor when a controlled call is being made. And um, along those lines, when a case is closed, is the survivor given other options, not legal ones? So we uh, issue a bill of rights um, to every to every complainant when, when they, the case the case starts. Um, we also give uh, information regarding how to contact. An advocate, and that is in the squads where we don't have an advocate embedded at this time. Uh, resource pamphlets are given out as well for rape, rape crisis centers and counseling. Uh, they are they receive the the uh, what to expect form uh, regarding the investigation, and they're also given a form uh, if they would like to discontinue their investigation at any time. They know that a part of the Bill of Rights it states that, so that the form is made available. If, if needed. Uh, doing the control phone calls, uh, there are times that we have advocates uh, present and, and there are times that we, we may not. It depends on if we are able to, if we're in a squad that has an advocate working there. If there is no advocate working in the squad, then we can reach out to an advocate. But if an advocate cannot uh, respond, they may speak to the uh, survivor and set up a time when they can speak again, uh, but they are not always present for the control call. Wow, uh, there's a lot to unpack there and the, for the uh, purposes of time, uh, you know, I'm gonna, uh, I, I, again, you paint a beautiful story. Uh, I think if you stay and listen to the survivors who are going to testify today, you're going to hear situations where that did not occur. Um, but isn't there supposed to be an advocate on site at the SV, at each of the five SVDs every day? So uh, we have the space built out for that. Uh, when I when I got here, I spoke to Safe Horizon, um, and because of COVID, they were not uh, at the time coming into the squads to sit there daily. 
Um, they gave us contact information regarding phone numbers and emails that we could pass on to uh, survivors. But I think in Manhattan and the Bronx, we have advocates that are physically present. But um, as, as uh, what, what uh, Safe Horizon told me, they have not yet been, a been able to identify their members to actually sit in the squad. I'm expired. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you for the extra time. Thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal. Um, if any other council members have any questions to ask the administration, please use the Zoom raise hand function now. Um, if not, we will be moving on to uh, public testimony. Uh, looks like, go ahead, Chair Diaz. Um, I apologize, but it's just like, I'm feeding off, off of all my, my members here. Thank you all for being so involved and engaged. Did I hear correctly to say Horizon, the lead agency has not been able to give you a link to where you can actually speak to an advocate? I mean, this no, is the, no, world, they, the, the they, world of, of virtualism. They give us contact information that we pass on to uh, complainants. And, and also not every complainant will, will request to speak to an advocate, even when we give them the information, but we do make it available. I think Inspector King was talking about uh, the idea of a co-located facilities that Safe Horizon hasn't had everyone in their co-located facilities where we have the space at the moment, but they have people available to speak to the survivors. Right. Okay, thank you for the clarity because that was definitely upsetting. Thank you. Back to committee council. Uh, thank you, Chair Diaz. Um, do any other council members uh, have any questions for the NYPD before we move on to public testimony? Okay, seeing, seeing no council members as well, um, we'll now move on to the public testimony section of uh, this hearing. Um, thank you, administration, for testifying, and um, we appreciate your testimony. Um, uh, sir, may, may I just uh, state to uh, Chair Adams, Chair, Chair Diaz, um, a little bit about my uh, background. I just want you to know, I've uh, been a nurse for 15 years, and I volunteered to be a forensic examiner, um, which is as a a nurse that is a special training you take outside of your nursing program and degree. Uh, I, I took that, I volunteered to take that because it was my passion to help victims of sexual assault. This is, when I took this training, this is something that no one at my hospital wanted to do. I took that upon myself. I worked in Staten Island, I worked in Brooklyn, I worked in various hospital emergency rooms. Um, uh, on call at night, I would respond and uh, I would examine. Uh, victims and survivors of sexual assault. And when, when this job became available and Council Member Rosenthal asked me, why do you want this job? Again, I was not uh, just given this, this assignment. I requested it because I believe it is the most challenging and the most uh, rewarding position within the New York City Police Department. It is, it is a tough job. Um, I do try to identify the right people to do this job. I have uh, transferred at least 12 people out of special victims who I believe were not right fit. I've moved around 18 other people just to make sure we have a good balance. But I want you to know, I'm not someone who was just a patrol cop and I walked into this position. I have done years of examining survivors of sexual assault. And again, that was a job that nobody wanted to do. And I volunteer and I, I'm hoping that background will continue to help me help survivors as I remain in this role. And I'm gonna thank you for that, Inspector King. Um, for, for those remarks, and I am going to personally request that you remain for uh, this entire hearing so that you can hear the testimony of these survivors that will be providing testimony. I know it's customary for, uh, for our admin to leave these hearings, but due to what you just said particularly, um, I think that it's important that you hear the testimony of these survivors. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Adams and Chair Diaz. Um, we'll now move to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike in our typical council hearings, we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on the panelist. I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you, and you will begin to deliver your testimony. Um, for the public, we are going to put a, a three-minute timer on testimony. Um, to begin, we will ask, let me just... Excuse me, I have a question before we begin. Sure, uh, go I'd ahead. Like to, 
thank Chair Adams for asking the question. I did not hear a yes or no. From the administration, will they stay? Deputy Inspector, I, I thank you for, for standing up for the underserved and choosing your profession, but I'd like to know if that was a yes. Will you have the opportunity to stay with us in here on the panelists? Yes, yes, I will remain, yes. Thank you very much. I go back to my to protocol in my script. <laughs> uh, thank, thank you, Chair Diaz. Um, so for the first member of the public, um, we will be inviting Once you're muted. Starting time. Good morning, and thank you for allowing me to share my story with you today. My name is Leslie McFadden. Six years ago this week, I was drugged and raped by a colleague. My experience with the NYPD, however, was far worse. Earlier this morning, Inspector Michael King mentioned that many victims wind up feeling not believed, which therefore discourages them from continuing in their cases. I wanna to stress to you that the NYPD is causing that belief and in fact is closing their cases without their knowledge. I'll give you a personal example. I was foolishly optimistic when a special victims detective from Brooklyn named Scott Grenai was assigned to my case in October, 2015. But the very first question he asked me at the start of his interview was whether this was really a case of sexual assault or just a case of regret. I had to start our conversation by explaining why I was wasting his time with my rape. He told me the case depended on getting a, a confession or positive drug test. At his recommendation, I went to the precinct and made a taped phone call to the perpetrator, even though I was terrified to do so and poorly coached on what to say. After the call, the detective told me there wasn't much to go on and presented me with a form that he said would put the case on hold pending a drug test. I was crying so hard I could barely see the form, let alone read it. So I trusted the detective's explanation and signed it. Once he had my signature on that form, Grenai did nothing, literally nothing. He did not pursue proper forensic testing to look for a drug, retrieve surveillance tapes, or interview any witnesses. He never even contacted the perpetrator. Had he followed these leads, my case could have been viable. Instead, he secretly closed the case just days later without ever doing anything at all. I would find out years later that this form was a case closure form, that C3 form that was mentioned earlier. Grenai had lied to me. In 2018, I met with, in person with then Chief of Detectives Dermot Shea and then Detective Chief Judith Harrison and told them both about Grenai's deliberate botching of my case. After that meeting, I later learned Grenai was selected for a newly created drug and alcohol facilitated analytical team. So just to be clear, he was rewarded, not punished, after I, after I reported his failures. It was not until I filed a formal complaint in 2020 that Grenai was finally transferred out of the SVU. The NYPD never held him accountable. I did. The NYPD refused to give me written proof that he was transferred and in fact never responded to my full request that I filed one year ago. It's time that the NYPD be made to care. We need top-down changes in how the NYPD investigates sexual assault cases. We need better trained detectives who will treat- I'm expired. Thank you. Can you let her finish her sentence? Let her finish her sentence. Leslie, finish her sentence. Thank you so much. Um, who will treat traumatized victims with compassion and conduct thorough investigations every single time. It's not too much to ask. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony, Leslie. Happy to be here. I will uh, move on to the next uh, panelist. Um, we will have
Go, go ahead, Megan. Sorry about that confusion there. Go ahead. No worries. Thank you. Um, okay. So thank you very much uh, to the committee and to the members of city council for this opportunity. I'm going to try to fit everything into three minutes here. So my name is Megan. I am 26 years old right now. Uh, almost six years ago in 2015, in the early morning hours of Halloween, I was raped by a stranger in a Brooklyn park. My rapist then walked me home to my apartment while I bled through my jeans. I don't remember giving him my number at the time, but I did. I was scared and I wanted him to leave me alone so that I could go home to my apartment safely. At the time, I was 20 years old and a full-time college student. The rape was my second sexual experience and I was not taking birth control at the time. A week later, I made the difficult decision to report to Brooklyn Special Victims Detectives at the 72nd Precinct. A female SVU detective took a statement from me, collected my bloody pants and underwear, and collected a swab from the inside of my cheek. I went alone to the precinct, trusting that the NYPD would help and advise me because I had no other advocate there for me. In the course of giving my statement to SVD, I shared that my rapist had been calling and leaving me messages. As a result, I was told that if I wanted to continue to build a case against him, I would need to call him while being recorded by detectives in an, admit, in an attempt to get him to admit that he had raped me while I was intoxicated, which is third degree rape, or that he had continued raping me despite me crying, screaming, and begging for him to stop, which is first degree rape. I knew I did not want to contact my rapist who was already harassing me after raping me, but this was the only option that was presented to me by detectives. When the detective called back a few, year, few days later, I declined to proceed with the investigation because of this, and I assumed that nothing would come from my interaction with detectives. I was 20 years old, and I had never had to rely on the police like this before. I had no idea what my rights were as a victim or what power I had, if any, into the investigation of my own rape. Those were, sorry, those were the hardest years of my life. I was angry, suicidal, sorry. <laughs> and I was suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. That fall, I didn't hear a word from SVU and assumed that they had closed the investigation. After two months of vomiting and missed periods, I realized that I was pregnant and took a pregnancy test on December 31st of 2015. It was positive. Time. I'm going to keep going if that's okay. Please allow her to keep going. Thank you for your courage. Thank you. I cannot explain to you what it feels like to have your body violated so violently and then to learn that your body still does not belong to you because you are carrying your rapist child. The week between realizing I was pregnant and my abortion was so hard, I considered every method I could think of to harm myself or end the pregnancy. I no longer cared what happened to me because I wanted out of my body so badly. On the day of my abortion, as I sat in the waiting room, I received a call from an SVU detective informing me that they had pulled DNA off my pants. This was the first time I had been contacted by SVU in two months. Two months. And this was the first time I had been informed that they were testing the clothing I had given them for DNA. I informed the detective that I was pregnant, which is a pretty solid piece of evidence, but that I could not wait any longer to have an abortion. That was the last time I spoke to an SVU detective. I never had a say in the decision to prosecute my own rapist. It was decided by SVU detectives without me. It was decided when the only option for justice in my case was to contact my own rapist. It was decided when SVU decided, neglected to contact me for months leaving me thinking that they had dropped my case entirely instead of informing me that they were testing my kit for DNA. 
All NYPD had to do was keep me informed with a phone call and they neglected to do that. By the time I was aware that they were actually working to investigate my rape, it was too late for me to provide the evidence of a pregnancy that would have significantly assisted in an investigation. You can't see my face here, but I'm white. I presented to SVU what is arguably an easy case by their standards, a young woman violently raped by a stranger. If they couldn't manage to call me once in two months, how do they treat victims that are people of color? If they couldn't manage to investigate a stranger rape without an assistance of his victim, how do they investigate cases where the perpetrator, like most rape cases, is in an intimate relationship with the victim? What kind of investigation is it when the victim is asked to do the investigating? A few months after the rape, I did investigating of my own. I searched my rapist number on Facebook and I found his profile in under five minutes. I identified my own rapist, which is something that the NYPD could not or would not do for me. It should never be on the backs of survivors to investigate our own case. We should not be asked to contact a person who violently raped us, which I, as I'm now hearing from previous testimony seems to be the investigative MO by NYPD SVU detectives. All the progress I have made in recovering from my rape, including hundreds of hours of therapy at my own expense, has been despite the actions of the NYPD, not because of anything they provided to me. They only contributed more to my trauma. People deserve better, I deserved better. Unfortunately, what I'm hearing from previous testimony is that this method of investigation has not changed. I hope in the future this does change so that other people don't go through this as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Um, Councilmember Rosenthal, um, you have your hand raised. You may go ahead. Uh, thank you so much. Megan, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. And I want to send appreciation to the NYPD for staying on. I see all four people in the conference room. And, um, you know, it, it's, um, I know it's meaningful that you're here listening and, um, as people, as we heard, are obviously re-traumatized even by coming forth. And for the public, um, the people on the panel are able to see uh, a gallery with the other people who are coming to testify. And you should know that people are weeping now, uh, Megan, hearing your testimony, uh, because it resonates. It resonates with other survivors who have suffered like you. Um, uh, I know this is not totally protocol, um, but, and, and if it's just not, and you can't, you know, it's just not anything you can answer. Uh, could I ask the NYPD, and I'm gonna step away for a moment on adult cases, really because this, uh, Recent testimony is a little overwhelming to me too. Um, but in the same vein on follow-up, um, in my opening statement, I referred to two uh, child uh, deaths uh, where they're within the last month and a half where there were many opportunities for follow-up where someone could have asked more questions uh, before these children were sexually abused and killed. Um, and I'm wondering if there have been changes since then uh, to require officers do more uh, to determine whether or not there is a plausible explanation for an injury. You said a plausible explanation for uh, what, Councilor Rosenthal? The, the child's injury. In other words, ah, yes, yes. Um, have there been changes since we 
have learned. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, so first of all, let me say to the survivors who had the courage to speak here today that your testimony does not fall on deaf ears. Um, since I have been the commander here, let me say that I have spread the word throughout the division that laziness and callousness will not be accepted here, which is why I have already transferred at least 12 people out of special victims. I have given people command disciplines, which are write-ups for bad behavior or bad case management. I review complaints that I get from uh, advocates and from uh, the general public. And I call people into the carpet to explain why certain behaviors are done. And there is no excuse for any behavior that will make a survivor feel not believed or not encouraged. So I just want you to know, I was not here when your cases uh, occurred, except for uh, Christine, which I will look into that. I was not here five years ago. But just to let you know that today, regarding any complaints, I am known as heavy handed. We do not accept anyone working here who does not have the compassion that is needed to be here. Uh, in regard to your questions, uh, Councilmember Rosenthal, those two cases are very, very unfortunate. And, and, and before I, I address that, I just wanna say one philosophy that I try to push through the division and, and Megan, she highlighted this. And this is, again, for me being a sexual assault forensic examiner, and this is something I tell to everyone who currently works here and to everyone who wants to become an investigator in the special victim division. They need to understand that when a woman is sexually assaulted, and I will say the word rape, when a woman is raped, you can't give her back what she lost. So our cases are different because in a robbery case, you can give someone back the TV, the car that was stolen, the wallet. When a woman is raped, you can't give her back what was lost. This whole idea of justice and closure is only a myth. But when we show that we attempt, when we show that we even try or are trying and doing everything we can, to me, that means a lot more than putting handcuffs on someone. Because we are showing that not only did we take your complaint seriously, but we are moving forward with the investigation. We are trying our best. And I have this fight with district attorneys all the time. Just show that you are trying to do the right thing. We may not end up making an arrest. I understand that. But how does it look to a survivor that we're not even trying? So I do not accept anyone here with laziness. Just so you know that this is the new Special Victims Division. Now, Thank in terms you. of... For, for your heartfelt feedback, I, I'd like to turn it back over to counsel as I'm eager to hear from the victims. No, this is mental anguish. Oh, it can't hear me. Can you hear me or not? Yes. Okay. I, again, I, if it, was, it seemed to me as I was not heard, bottom line is, I really, look, Husband Rosenthal will come back to you, but we have victims that are mortified at this moment. We don't know how long it's been since they've been able to have a proper meal, but they've been able to get up this morning and move forward. I'm asking council members to please, we can go back at the end at a later time and ask questions, but our victims need, need to be heard. Thank you. I get council member regarding the two children. Uh, legacy, I believe the case that was, uh, that we had on the household was regarding a child that basically didn't exist. The complaint that we got months ago before Legacy was killed was on a, a, another child was named, but when special victim investigators went to her home, uh, there was no complaint regarding Legacy. It was regarding another child that did not live at the location. And that case was closed because there, whoever the, the anonymous complaint referred to did not reside with, with Legacy. And at the time that they went there, Legacy, there was no issue regarding a Legacy. Now with the four-year-old child that uh, was killed recently, a very, very unfortunate case. And in that case, I know I heard uh, council members state that there was no follow-up. Um, 
when that case was received, uh, the ACS workers did go out and they did see the child um, and they did not, I, I guess, see any uh, other injuries to escalate the situation. Um, but the marks that were seen were photographed and were given to the medical team at the CAC. The CAC then reached out to the mother and told the mother to bring the child in so that the child could be physically examined. On the day she was supposed to come in, uh, she did not. And then two days later, uh, the child uh, was killed. Um, so there, there was, and yes, the DIR was, was not done. And um, that was a mistake by the investigator. We have not seen him commit that mistake in prior cases. In this case, he, he neglected to, to fill that out. Um, but in terms of the child being seen, the child was seen prior to death and was, was not brought back when he was supposed to. So in regard to what has been done since then, um, I took a look at how we investigate child abuse, uh, our relationship with, with uh, ACS, and what I have implemented is in the past, uh, child abuse investigators would get the case and ACS would do the visits. I have now changed that to where our child investigators will be doing unannounced visits to families when there are complaints of child abuse against children. So we will be going out immediately once we get a complaint. Prior to the case being closed, we will be conducting a, another unannounced visit. Also, most importantly, this will be a red flag. Whenever the child squad sends out an uh, uh, a request to a parent or caregiver to bring an alleged abuse, abuse child into our space, and for some reason, that parent either calls and says, I can't make it, or they are a no-show, that will be a red flag, and that will be an immediate visit from the child abuse squad to find out why did you not bring that child in and to document if there are any further injuries. Okay, thank you so much uh, for that, that testimony. Um, we are uh, gonna move forward. We're gonna have um, the panelists uh, give their testimony and after each, we have, I believe, maybe four more people to testify here, and then we could turn to council members so we could ask the the, the testimony or providers of testimony uh, specific questions. I see council member Holden, you put your hand down. So if after we're done with this panel, we could come back to you if you have any specific questions for, for the panelists. In terms of questions for the police department, we will follow up with additional information to them. Um, so if we could try to keep the, the focus on the um, members of the public at this moment for now. Um, but council member Holden, uh, speak up, but I mean, I hope we're going to try to move it back to the, um, the individuals from the public, but go ahead, sir. Yes, I, and I appreciate it. I'm sorry. I'll just be very quick. Megan's testimony was so heartbreaking and so moving that I think I'd like to hear if the inspector can, can look at her case and we get some commitment that she gets some closure. I know it's, it's, it's late, but we need to we need we she knows the, the 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 perpetrator she knows her assailant she knows his name she, we have dna can we can this be investigated uh, inspector down and his own captain take a look at it it was it was 2015 I guess, yes, right? Yes. Right. Yes. So I will definitely reach out to the Brooklyn squad. We will pull that case. Myself and the uh, squad commander and his own captain will take a look at it and see what can be done. Thank you. Can I just have the last name of uh, Nathan? It's okay. G-A-R-V-E-R. -E no, we will please, please, let's leave that off of the, the record for now. Thank you. We will follow up with the NYPD specifically on that individual. Thank you, community. Thank you, council, for jumping in because I was going to. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll now turn to the next panelist. Um, again, council members, if we could, uh, you could use the Zoom raise hand function. We're gonna go through some more individuals from the public and then we could turn back for other questions for um, the members of the public. And, and again, we're gonna, we could do a follow-up letter with the NYPD if there are specific things you want to address additionally. Um, so for the next uh, testimony, I'm gonna invite Allison Turcos to uh, testify followed by Jane Manning. Go ahead. Starting time. Thank you. And I appreciate that the um, committee members are uh, allowing survivors to tell our entire stories and not being cut off by time. Um, I want to start by um, acknowledging that um, 
Mr. King said that our testimonies don't fall in deaf ears. Um, sir, I want to acknowledge that this is, for many of us, not our first rodeo. Many of us have been doing this for years, and you have heard these words before from people, and we have heard these words before from people in your position in power. Uh, for many of us, your words mean nothing because we want to see action. As you know, uh, actions speak louder, louder than words. Um, you are in your position of power right now accepting this. Um, and it's happening under your leadership, so I look forward to seeing actions. Um, thank you to the committee and members of the City Council for this opportunity. My name is Al My name is Allison Turcos, and I'm a multiple rape survivor. On Monday, October 17th, 2017, I reported to the Brooklyn Special Victims Division after being kidnapped at gunpoint and gang raped by a Lyft driver and two, at least two other men. I thought I was taking a step towards ending my trauma, I had no idea that in reporting my rape, I was simply entering another chapter of that trauma. The NYPD tells victims of sex crimes that they want us to report, that they're ready with resources to bring us justice. But I'm here today as an example of what reporting your rape to the NYPD Special Victims Division really looks like. Callous disregard and re-traumatization. Chair Adams highlighted how egregious it is that we as victims and survivors must become our own advocates. I want to highlight some of the ways that I was forced to do so. After reporting my rape to a local Brooklyn hospital, I received a bill for my kit. Because I also did not know my rights as a victim of a sex crime, I paid out of pocket for my own rape kit. It wasn't until later that I'd learned that in New York State, no victim of a sex crime should pay for their own kit. I had to contact the New York State Attorney General's office. At that time, who was Eric Schneiderman, who we now know is a serial perpetrator of harm and violence. I had to fight tooth and nail to get a refund. Months later, I had to contact OCME, the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner, for the results of my own rape kit because Maria Quinones, a detective within Brooklyn Special Victims, refused to hand over those results. I had to beg and plead with Brooklyn Special Victims Division, specifically Maria Quinones, to return my phone calls, emails, and voicemails. To your point, Councilmember Holden, women are not the answer. Detective Quinones refused to collect video evidence, refused to bring the driver in for questioning for at least three months, I could go on and on. But that's not what I'm choosing to focus on because you have heard from numerous survivors before me and you will hear from them after. We are here today because of survivors. We are here because of the collective power of survivors. We had the courage to report. We had the courage to be here today to speak our truth. And yet the New York Police Department Special Victims has never had the courage to show up for us. The Special Victims Time Division expired. cannot simultaneously, the Special Victims, I will finish, thank you. The Special Victims Division cannot simultaneously be our savior and the people who put us in this position, the people who are actively harming us. Members of the committee, I hope you hear our stories, our trauma, and turn them into action. I don't want our testimonies to become just another data point to be erased or to sit on a shelf. I reported in October 2017, it, will literally, it was literally four years ago to last week. I reported in October 2017, and in that time, we have seen three different people at the helm of special victims, and yet no significant changes. The special victims division has not fixed or adapted anything. Who do these broken systems benefit? We should not even have to be here today. How many times will these survivors like myself have to break themselves open to be believed? How many times must you bear witness to our pain, our suffering, our stories in order for the New York Police Department Special Victims to take true action. Victims and survivors refuse to remain silent so that Special Victims can stay comfortable. Who is more important here? Because I assure you, it is not us, it is not victims, it is not survivors. The victims and survivors in front of you today are magic. Our bravery, our courage, and our resilience is not finite. The Special Victims have tried for years to exhaust us out of existence, out of a system that they tout is survivors and trauma-centric and supposedly built for us, but yet has repeatedly failed every single survivor in front of you. Survivors will not shrink ourselves to fit within the system that has tried to silence us from the very moment that we went to special victims to seek justice. Our bodies have been rewritten by the suffering and the harm caused by the New York Police Department Special Victims Division. Members of the committee, you now have an opportunity to rewrite the script and truly center us, center the survivors and victims in front of you. Sometimes it astonishes me how much violence one body can contain. When a bomb goes off inside a building, the walls fall back from the sheer force of the blast, but survivors and victims stand in front of you fully intact. The power to hurt is a kind of wealth, and the New York Police Department has the largest budget. 
Thank you for witnessing our leadership. I am opening to answering any questions that you might have. Thank you for your testimony, Allison. We're gonna move on to one more person and then we can have council member questions as well after that. Um, I will now turn uh, to Jane Manning followed by Tamika Stukes. And, and again, we will have uh, full questions for this panel afterwards. Go ahead. Uh, I believe Jane, you're unmuted, go ahead. Starting time. Thank you so much. I'm Jane Manning. I'm director of the Women's Equal Justice Project, and I'm an advocate for survivors of sexual assault. Thank you so much, Chair Adams and Chair Diaz and Councilmember Rosenthal and members of the City Council. Thank you for your spot on questions today and for your staff who have been so accommodating to the survivors uh, who are speaking today. Um, most of all, I am grateful to the survivors who are testifying today. This is not easy to do. And they are summoning the strength to do it in hopes that it will lead to change. Uh, what I can offer to you as an advocate is that the stories you're hearing today are not isolated. They are systemic. I see them in case after case, the effects of the lack of proper staffing, proper training, proper experience, and desperately needed culture change. Uh, just to touch on a few of the themes that survivors raised uh, from Christine's story, um, uh, the experience of drug facilitated sexual assault. This is an epidemic in this city and an epidemic that the NYPD is not on top of and is totally unprepared to deal with. Detectives who are not trained to investigate, who don't understand the importance of hair testing, that's like a burglary unit that doesn't understand why fingerprints are important. Um, the understaffing, the stories you're hearing about detectives looking at the clock or saying, well, I have another case to work on, so I can't work on your case. Um, I had the same thing say to me, said to me by the second in command of special victims, uh, then executive officer Paul Saracino, who said to me, well, we have two stranger rapes right now, so we can't investigate your case where the victim is being stalked by her rapist. Um, Council member Holder was right, that should never be said, but let's look at why detectives are saying this. The answer is because it's true. 255 investigators in a force of 35,000 police officers, that equates to less than 1% of the police force assigned to investigate all cases of sexual assault and all cases of child abuse in New York City, though they are some of the most demanding and labor intensive cases. Christine was right. We don't just need the right quantity of detectives, we need the right quality. And right now, special victims is being flooded with white shields. These are officers who are not even detectives and have no investigative experience. Um, the problems with this are obvious. They are not trauma trained. They don't know how to investigate uh, a, a simple case, let alone a rape case. The video footage is one example of that. Uh, that's not being retrieved. Um, and finally, the controlled phone calls. I just want to say uh, this is a really important investigative tool if it's done correctly, but the detectives and special victims don't know how to prepare the survivor, how to defer to the wishes of the survivor, whether or not the survivor wants to participate in this controlled call, how to plan the call based on the facts and the evidentiary needs of that case, and how to support the survivor during and after a procedure that can be intensely stressful. The advocates and the survivor have been crying out for, for years about this and nothing has been done to fix it. If the NYPD leadership cared, we'd see a special victims with top-notch investigators in sufficient numbers with trauma-informed training to a person. What we are seeing in reality is the opposite. And so I beg those of you on the city council who have access to mayoral candidates, our two mayoral candidates, to say to them, the next police commissioner of NYPD needs to be someone with a mandate to take sexual assault seriously in New York City. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, we, we will have one more person on this panel followed by council member questions. Again, council members use the Zoom raise hand function if you have any questions. Um, and we will now turn to uh, Tamika Stukes, I believe. Um, are you here, Tamika? Yes, there you are. Go ahead. Starting Good. time. Good. Afternoon, members of the council. My name is Tamika Stooks, and I am the mother of a sexual abuse victim. Um, I'm very emotional, so do forgive me, but um, I encountered system failure from the top to the bottom, starting with NYPD. Let me first state that I am a retired 911 operator from 17 years of experience. At the time when I placed the call here in Staten Island for the police to respond to my location, the officers who responded were end of tour. They were tired. They were 
they had no empathy. My daughter was then 17 at the time and she did not want to talk to them. I requested a sergeant to respond to the location because of the mannerism in which they were speaking to my daughter. First thing went wrong there, a woman should have responded. That's number one, a victim. I'm a mother of a victim. The victim should never, ever, ever have to feel like they're being rushed, they're being treated cold. So, okay, just give me a second. Moving forward. The sergeant responded, did the paperwork. We were transferred to, since the incident occurred in Brooklyn, um, unlike a lot of the victims on this um, Zoom, my heart goes out to you, but uh, when we went to special victims, nobody from Safe Horizon was there. Um, arrest was made in my daughter's case. Uh, the arrest, I don't think the special victims unit did the appropriate investigating because my daughter woke up to her perpetrator on top of her. She was in tox. They charged him with a felony misdemeanor instead of a, a full felony. Um, I'm not a police officer. I don't know how charges, but I do know that that shouldn't have been the charge. Moving forward, members of the council, I do want you to understand in regards to how this case was handled, we went all the way. So I started with, I wasn't planning to go further, but now I am. We started with the police department where they felt her, when the lack of empathy they came when they, when they first responded. Then we go to special victims, not appropriately charging the perpetrator. But then if you wanna go further, we went all the way to court. We were available to testify and the DA's office dropped the ball. The perpetrator went 30-30 motion, and I received the call from Eric Gonzalez apologizing for his office sloppy work. So tell me for my victim, my daughter, an apology? We were offered therapy and counseling. She has that already. System Floyd started from the police department. <laughs> to everybody. I would just like the members of the council to look from the beginning to the end. I have all type of paperwork. And also Jane Manning, thank you. I found her on News One to be able to help me get to the bottom of this case. Any members of council who wanna contact me afterwards, I have envelopes full of information. So what I'm basically saying, after listening to all of these victims and being the mother of a victim, starts with the police department, proper training. First of all, women should be the only, only ones responding to females of sexual abuse. There's a little bit more comfort and a little bit more ease there for the woman. It takes a lot of courage for you victims, Meg, Christina, all of you guys. We did get a little bit further than y'all. We did get an arrest, but he walked because the system failed. So I'm at the city council, like Ms. Mann said, the mayor's office even felt it. Three minutes is not enough for y'all to hear my story, but I've been fighting and I had to go and I've been getting compliments about the work I've done. I don't need a compliment, I need justice and change to make sure no other victims feel failed by the city system. And that's all I have to say. Thank you for your testimony. If any council members would like to ask questions of any of the panelists who just spoke, please use the Zoom raise hand function. Um, Councilwoman Diaz, I, I don't have a question, but I will be following up with DA Gonzalez and with Safe Horizon. You know, we need to do better. And, and that's the bottom line. Uh, thank you, Chair Diaz. Um, looks like we have questions from two council members, members of the public. Um, we will, uh, uh, after the, we, we are calling on a panel as um, in order. So uh, you could remove the raise hand function. You will be called on as uh, 
accordingly. I uh, apologize. Um, Council Member uh, Holden followed by Council Member Rosenthal um, for these uh, this panel. Go ahead, Council Member Holden. Starting time. Yes, and, and let me just assure the um, you know the people giving testimony, the victims, and 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 Tamika. By the way, don't give up. I mean, I think we're we're going to change this. And the fact that the inspector is listening, the police department is listening to this, and I think that's a great move to 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 um, request that they stay on. The administration did stay on. The NYPD's here, uh, and and Jane, you you made a great point. And I promise as a council member in the next council that I will do everything to increase that number from 255 and we should double it, like you said, or more. Um, that's very, very important because in, in a city of almost 9 million people, I guess, that's so little that it obviously these things will happen. So the detectives are overworked. I mean, you see that from police officers uh, every day responding to things in the community they're they're kind of burnt out at this point they're they're handling so many calls and they see the very worst of of new york city residents all the time because they're going to problems so they're human beings too so we really have to hire more cops and i know that's not popular but i think if you look at you know the areas that we need them the special you know victims unit is it should be doubled or tripled in the number of officers and detectives. So this Jane made a great point, and I thank her. Um, Allison made some great points. I think all this testimony is very valuable. But thank you, thank you all to the panelists that that just spoke. Uh, you've done a, a great service to the the victims uh, of these crimes. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Holden. Um, next, we'll go to Councilmember Rosenthal for questions. Uh, and if any other council members have any questions, please use the Zoom raise hand function. Thank you. Go ahead, Councilmember Rosenthal. Yeah, and first, just very simply, uh, for all the survivors, uh, the, you, no question, we don't need to, your testimony raises all of the problems. I don't, I own, I, um, you know, we need to, as council member Holden said, double the size of the SVD detective squad. I'm not sure. I, I personally don't think we need to add police officers to do that um, with 36,000 officers and, and quite a few detectives. I'm quite sure that you know, with the proper training, intense training, um, that we can find 500 detectives who could really uh, do this work. And again, just making that connection. If you had more detectives doing the work, they would never feel that pressure of, oh, I have another case to work on, right? They would the pressure would be lightened. Right now, there are, according, uh, you know, to the to the public information, something like fifty to sixty cases for each open cases for each newly opened cases, for each detective. Not not counting the ones that they have from the previous year. We know from other localities and research even including inside the NYPD that the better number is 14 to 20 cases per detective. So that's really the goal when we get to that number and we are training them, uh, we're not, we're gonna be in a better place. Um, and secondly, when I flip my screen, I know this has been a very triggering event for a lot of people. Um, you're going to see the rain hotline number, uh, and and I would urge you to um, contact them. And I, I know, I know, I see you shaking your head, Tamika. I'm with you. I'm with you. Uh, it, it's it's it is the least I can do uh, is is to provide the hotline number, of course. The real solutions are 
training and doubling the size of the force. And by training, you know, this is 40 days of training. We're talking about real intensive training. I, I'm sorry. I, I wish I could do more. I, my heart is with you, Tamika. I, there's, you're right. There's nothing I can say. So I agree with that. And my heart's breaking. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal. Um, for our next panel, um, we will begin with Fatima Perkins, followed by Jennifer Dempsey. I saw Fatima had her hand raised earlier. I, is she back on? Yes. yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. A good afternoon, all. Uh, my name is Fatima Perkins, and I too am here as a mother of a rape survivor with disabilities. Um, after witnessing firsthand the utter maltreatment and blatant disrespect and disregard for my daughter's mental capacity, I drafted a bill which is named D's Law, calling for and demanding reform for the state's rape laws for people with disabilities. My daughter suffers from what is called receptive language disorder, meaning that she misinterprets things, and that was used against her from beginning to end by the SBU and the Queens District Attorney. My daughter was scrutinized for over 20 plus hours, which included her getting a rape kit done, which concluded unequivocally that she was a virgin who had been brutally raped, yet due to her mental illness, all that was overlooked because as I heard over and over from both NYPD, SVU and the DA, are you sure that's what happened? Are you sure she fully understood what occurred? These are absolutely inappropriate questions to ask of a victim or their family members, especially when there is solid evidence proving an assault took place. Also, there are things, pardon me, there needs to be proper time frame as to when victims are questioned. No person disabled or able-bodied should be questioned by a DA after succumbing to such a trauma, then being drugged by multiple antibiotics, HIV preventative meds, which are given as part of a rape kit. And if they are disabled, their own psychotropic medication, which then on top of that creates fatigue and ultimately confusion. No one under that much stress and that much drugs could possibly give an accurate statement deemed good enough to fully prosecute a perpetrator. I feel both the NYPD, SBU, and the DA as a whole should be better trained in how to deal with cases involving the disabled, and there should be special advocates well-versed in dealing with disabled people who assist them and those other entities in handling such cases. And most of all, there needs to be some sympathy shown for all victims across the board. Personally, I feel that their personal feelings and assumptions are not a part of their job descriptions and therefore need not to rear their ugly heads at the most inopportune times in a person's life. There also needs to be a definitive definition of what the word minor is considered to be. You cannot say that a 15 year old can't sign a legal document because they're a minor, yet they can be questioned by authorities without a parent or guardian because they are not a minor. But again, this is where the word assumption comes into play because I was told my 15 year old daughter was allowed to be questioned without me because, and I quote from the Queens District Attorney, teenagers don't like talking about things in front of their parents. And according to my understanding, a district attorney is supposed to deal with facts and not that assumption. Hence my daughter, not being, excuse me, being questioned without me present and without the district attorney fully understanding the extent of my daughter's mental capacity. All in all, there needs to be changes made immediately because sexual violence rates have gone up, but the proper treatment of victims diminishes every day with every reporting victim. And that cannot and will not be tolerated by myself as a mother or by millions of victims who are being violated and further violated by the groups of insensitive beings that are put in place to protect and serve. 
My daughter got absolutely no justice, but I am determined to make sure that it doesn't happen to another mother's child by never remaining silent. And to Tamika, I will never, ever remain silent for your child, my child, or anyone else. And I thank you, the council members, and everyone listening for their time. Thank you so much for your testimony. We were going to um, continue with uh, public testimony. And as a reminder, again, if council members have questions, we will go to those questions after the panel is completed. Um, we have next is uh, Jennifer Dembski, followed by Sonia Osario. Jennifer, you may begin. Um, hi, are you able to hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you again, uh, everybody for the opportunity to testify today. Um, and thank you to everybody who's shared before me. Um, this is not have what I have written down, but I, you know, this is the middle of the day on a Monday, I'm juggling uh, work deadlines as I'm listening to everybody's accounts. And it's, I mean, just the the mental bandwidth that I've given to this issue over the past five years has is it, I don't have words for it. Um, I'm going to just read what I wrote. Okay, um, I am currently the plaintiff in a pending lawsuit against the NYPD uh, that seeks to address the misogyny and sex discrimination that is at the root of the lack of resources and training and efforts uh, to address sexual violence, uh, which is predominantly felt by women. Um, the issues at the NYPD are systemic. Um, I want to speak to the importance of training uniformed officers and holding them accountable for how they interact with victims of domestic violence and sexual assault, um, including their misuse of domestic violence incident reports. Um, in January of 2016, I walked into the 78th precinct to report a partner rape. I knew that reporting would be emotionally difficult, but did not expect to be denied the chance to even speak with an SVD detective. Um, I did not expect that I'd be giving my report in an open room with the door wide open while random officers were in and out eating meals, etc. I did not expect inappropriate comments on my appearance from a male sergeant. I didn't expect that I'd be told that even though I was asleep when the assault began, it wasn't right because I didn't fight back. I did not expect to have a sergeant sit across from me and say that he has sex with his wife while he's, she's asleep and she's not reporting him for rape. I walked away with a domestic violence incident report that classified my rape as a dispute on which the officer's written description of my complaint did not match my written account of a clear sexual assault on the same document. In 2018, I filed a complaint to the CCRB regarding my treatment by these officers. I received a letter stating that my complaint was going to be investigated by IAB, and I never heard anything from IAB about the complaint after that. I was now burdened with processing the trauma of my reporting experience in addition to the trauma of the actual rape. I developed PTSD, which resulted in insomnia, panic attacks, agoraphobia, and flashbacks. My friendships and working relationships suffered. I obsessed over what I could have done differently. I blamed myself for not bringing an advocate with me, for not being able to remember uh, the uh, perpetrator's address, for crying when I reported the assault. Then in March of 2018, I read the Department of Investigation's report on the NYPD's Special Victims Division. I learned the NYPD had for many years lacked adequate staff funding and training to properly investigate the number of adult sex crimes that were reported each year. I learned that the NYPD leadership had ignored all recommendations to resolve these issues. I learned that NYPD policy and practice meant that uniformed precinct officers with little to no appropriate training were often the only law enforcement officers with whom victims of acquaintance, date, and partner rapes would ever interact. The result was the the result was the perpetuate, sorry, the result was the perpetuation by the NYPD's leadership of immeasurable harm on victims of rape by a known assailant who are mostly women. Uh, the report made me furious because of the NYPD's decisions to do nothing to improve well-documented issues in the Special Victims Division. I walked into a situation on January 6, 2016 that was guaranteed to traumatize me. I walked into a situation where precinct officers with no training in sex crimes were given the sole discretion to judge the merits of my report. And because they were able to use the dispute checkbox on the mandatory DV incident report, which I later learned is only meant to be used when police are called to incidents that are clearly a misunderstanding, um, they 
they basically ensured that my report would not be included in any statistics regarding recorded, reported cases of assault. The NYPD says that it wants to empower victims to report their rapes, and then as a policy, it traumatizes us further when we do. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Jennifer. We have one more panelist on this panel. Um, we will ask, uh, one second, Murray Shane to testify. And, and again, council members, we will turn to questions to you after uh, this individual speaks. And please use the Zoom raise hand function if you'd like to ask any questions of the individuals who just spoke. Thank you. Starting time. Hi, my name is uh, Murray Shane. I'm a retired psychiatrist. Um, I worked in as a psychiatrist in New York City for 40 some years. Uh, I'm also president of a male survivor, a non-for-profit organization that advocates and basically provides su support services and referral services for men who've been sexually abused. Uh, we've been in existence for 25 years and the kind of services we offer prim our primary uh, one is a, a worldwide discussion forum, which has 15,000 registered users and thousands more who are visitors. It's a moderated, we also have a moderated, intensely moderated chat room. We uh, provide webinars of training free. Uh, we also do training programs for agencies. And in fact, I gave a one hour presentation to the Crime Victims Rights Conference in 2019 here in New York, basically dealing with male sexual abuse and, uh, and, in, and how, to inter how to intervene. And uh, we also refer people to other programs such as Men Healing, which offers weekend webinars of intensive healing programs. We, uh, we support the development of local support groups, um, including one in New York City, OBDY, o OBDI, which is operating in Yonkers, mainly serves uh, men of color. Uh, and we, uh, we also uh, refer people to the Mount Sinai Morningside group sponsored by the police department's uh, special victims unit for it's a time limited, I think 15 week group for male survivors. And of course we have a massive th therapist referral system. But the thing that I, I, I wanted to focus on was what I've been hearing and which uh, is that the training, the sensitivity training for people interviewing people who come in to report a sexual abuse is one of the most critically sensitive kinds of interviewing one can do. And the important part of that training has to be the person's ability, the interviewer's ability to turn off his sense of himself, herself, her regard to anything that uh, any just uh, judgments about the person reporting. Uh, it's as though if you're, if, as a psychiatrist, interviewing someone who's uh, actively suicidal and getting angry at them that they're taking my time and, and that they, they dare to, you know, make this ridiculous effort to try to kill themselves. I mean, it's the, the insensitivity that starts. And, and this also, I think what happens is that people who are confronted with really desperately terrible situations get angry at the person who's reporting and inadvertently in the cases we've heard they actually re-traumatize and actually accuse indirectly the person reporting their own assault as though they are assaulting the interviewer and everything proceeds from there and i think what happens the more people are active in trying to pursue their case the more anger they engender in the people that they're uh, are trying to uh, get help from. And they point out the things that were not done that makes the uh, police department or the per, whoever they're reporting to feel insecure and adequate that they didn't do what they were supposed to do. And they get angry back at the person. So it's, it's a horrible, vicious cycle. But I think that the, uh, the things that the, the sensitivity training 40 weeks with all the other information does hardly seems uh, enough time for people to get aware of what they're going to have to be like when they interview people reporting abuse. And I just wanted to read some of the things that male survivors have said about their experience with 
police. Uh, one, what is because of the way I was treated as a teenage street kid by police, I would not likely pursue any justice through them. Another one said, I believe most survivors have not gotten justice in any form from the abuser, the institution, and many times those around them who deny the abuse, which is very common with men. And that is that they're told that the, their, their abuse is denied as it has happened with many of the women testifying today. The police uh, also, another one, the police said the statute of limitations was passed on my story. They said I should try to forget it. Uh, another one, I made a trip to the city where I was abused and filed police reports. Originally, the detective didn't believe my story. He said all the words were there, but the emotion wasn't. He told me after the investigation, maybe I took too many anxiety pills prior to walking in the door. One of the things that men uh, tend to do when they are reporting is they, they feel that they have to present themselves, considering what they've experienced, as intact as their manhood or their maleness is there. So they, they, will, they will try to appear calm and in charge. And this will make it seem, well, they're not victims at all. Another one said, I tried to go to the local police department and have a report made. I had all the paperwork of my research back then. The cop threw up his hands and said, quote, there are too many people involved and that he could not make out a report. So I think that finally, uh, I'll get one more. And I was raped at, 13 by a stranger. The policeman said I should have tried harder to escape. He then made some cracks about AIDS that terrified me. And in response, this too happened about 30 years ago when the police showed up, they said he should have fought, I should have fought back harder. And so the, the, the issues are really complicated. And, but I think it begins with the interviewers and everyone involved in dealing with survivors. They have to have an ability to process their own feelings and listen and uh, only only use empathy to engage with these with uh, people reporting and that's very difficult and not something you learn from a PowerPoint. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your testimony. Um, uh, we are now going to have a. Uh, Sonia Osario, who I believe I skipped over before. Um, you may uh, testify now, um, following which we get a break for council member questions. And then the, the next panel would be, um, I'm gonna just run off some names so you're aware, uh, Shamara, Karen, Kelly Dwyer. Um, but for now, Sonia, you may begin. And, and again, council members, if you have any questions for the folks who just spoke, please use the Zoom raise hand function. Go ahead, Sonia. Thank you so very much. And thank you to all of the speakers, um, Murray, for talking about men in this whole situation and all of the survivors today. I wish that I could say, as my colleagues, I'm sure agree, that we wouldn't have to go through this over and over. For those council people who are on this call for the first time, thank you so much for your interest. And I know that you are gonna work really, really hard to change this dynamic and for New York City to become a place that is known for making crimes against women and sex crimes a priority. But for many of us, we have been doing this over and over year after year. Of everything that I've heard today from the NYPD, I don't see where the change is gonna happen. The, DO, the DOI report that was 2018, year-long investigation, understaffed division, 67 detectives for 5,000 cases, too little specialized training, failure to call victims back to keep them informed. You've heard it all. I don't have to go through the list. The one area that there has been a great deal of improvement is on the facilities, um, though that there is great progress being made on that and you should get credit for that. But frankly, we're not gonna get the movement that we need until we have real leadership from the top. As one of my colleagues, Jane Manning stated, it's not gonna happen. You know, when our current mayor, his response to the DOI report in 2018 was to have somebody else say that it was the best in class in the nation. And if you think 
that it stings you today to listen to these survivors have to tell their stories over and over, that four and five and six years later, they're still fighting for justice. That was a real slap in the face for survivors from the mayor of the city. And it is gonna be on us, and that's me as well. I run an organization, it's called Women's Justice Now. But I need you to work with us, everybody that's on this call, to make sure that we spread this message of what's important and what our priorities are gonna be and galvanize everybody else on this city council and the incoming mayor. We are on a precipice right now. We have that opportunity to finally do it. I don't wanna be here next year. I don't wanna be here the year after that because I'm afraid to tell you that the women who came before me were also here doing the same thing. We've identified the problems. You've heard from them firsthand. We have great detectives. We have great um, incentives within the NYPD to happen. We've got to push forward. Thank you so very much for your time. Thank you so much, Sonia. Um, we're going to do a, a bit of an audible here. We're going to have um, Rachel Izzo, who is um, with us at work, who is asking to kind of make a quick testimony. We're going to do her to finish up the panel, then turn to council member questions um, and continue on, as I mentioned before. Thank you so much. Rachel, go ahead. Loving time. Ryan, can you guys hear me OK? OK. Um, first of all, Sonia, I remember you, you wrote something about my case that came up at one point, and I really appreciated that. That was a few years ago, so I wanted to mention that because I remember that very clearly. Um, so I'm going to start um, trying to get through this quickly. I know you guys are on the time crunch, and so am I. I got to go back to work. But my name is Rachel Izzo, and I'm an ER nurse, and I'm also a sexual assault nurse examiner. My experience with the NYPD started on July 5th, 2013. When I first met Detective Lucas Skorzewski and Lieutenant Adam Lamboy in a small room in Seattle University, I was impressed by the professionalism. However, that soon evaporated. The next day, what started out as a casual meeting turned into a 10-hour drinking binge in downtown Seattle. After this outing, I pleaded with him that I needed to go back to my home. Lieutenant Lamboy suggested that I lie to my parents and call out of work the next day and that they would take care of me at their hotel room in Bellevue. In my gut, this entire experience felt wrong, loaded with red flags, but my trauma brain convinced me otherwise. They were the ones with the badges and in charge, and I trusted them. I ended up in a hotel room with Detective Skorzewski that night, and he gave me the bed while he slept on the couch. The next morning, Detective Skorzewski climbed into bed with me and started touching me. I completely froze. My heart was pounding in my throat, and I thought to myself, how is this happening? The only thing that I could say was, I need to leave my clothes on. This was the exact boundary I had set with the person who had sexually assaulted me. And when I told Skorzewski this, he chuckled. I laid there frozen, feeling his erection pressed against my back, my heart, and my throat. And then he kissed me. He eventually stood up and went to the shower, and I sat there crying, blaming myself, feeling disgusted with myself that I let this happen. I left pretend pretending like nothing had happened. The next day, Lieutenant Lamboy said everything that happened this weekend had to stay between us or my credibility would be shot. I pushed this experience down for many weeks, but the trauma manifested in my body in anxiety attacks and sleepless nights. It wreaked full havoc on my nervous system and I could barely function. Weeks later, he confessed that he had feelings for me and the trauma of the hotel room came back. I had ignored that feeling deep down because I wanted to trust that they had my best intentions at heart, but at that point I knew they didn't. In the end, they closed my case without ever speaking to my rapist. When I called the precinct in November for a follow-up, a female detective answered the phone and said, your case is closed, Rachel, don't call here anymore. I asked why, and she repeated the same response, adding, we don't play games here. I'm sorry he gave you an STD, but that does not mean anything criminal happened. After this, I had a complete meltdown and sank into a very dark place. I was, with a tremendous amount, I was left with a tremendous amount of pain and trauma that I did not know how to heal from. I moved to New York in January of 2014 to 10 NYU nursing school and started to rebuild my life. In April of 2014, I filed an internal affairs a complaint against the SVD. Eight months later, that case closed. Skorzewski was transferred out of the SVD, but still kept his badge, and Lieutenant Lamboy retired with his full pension. After years of trauma with the NYPD, I had to leave the city that I loved. It was the only way for me to heal, because what the NYPD put me through was actually far worse than my actual sexual assault. Let that sink in. It was worse than my sexual assault itself. I'm a registered nurse. 
if I had even had just one shred of the interaction that Skorzewski and Lamboy had had with me, I would have been fired and had my license revoked immediately. Their punishments were unacceptable, given that in any other professional organization, the consequences of these actions would have been far more severe. What I experienced with the NYPD was both unnecessary and disgusting, and there needs to be drastic change. And in the eight years since this has happened and since I have been advocating for change, I have seen very little. Survivors of gender-based violence deserve better. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, now that we've completed that panel, we'll have opportunity for council member questions. So please use the Zoom raise hand function if you have any questions. After which we'll be turning to a panel, which will start with uh, Shamara, followed by Karen, followed by Kelly Dwyer. So do any council members have any specific questions for the folks who just testified? Please speak up now. Okie doke. Um, we will now turn uh, next to Shamara, followed by Karen. Um, let's see, ensure that you're unmuted and you may begin. Starting time. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Shamara Kelly, survivor and domestic violence advocate and community organizer at Voices of Women. During the pandemic, the news that many government officials emphasized how the DV was incre increasing, when in reality, DV adv advocates like myself and others, this was normal. The, the pandemic just uncovered the truth. Domestic violence is a pandemic in itself. All city and government officials were closed. Safe horizon advocates were ruled. And so risk victims reached out to grassroots org orgs and CBOs like the one I work for. So we can nav nav navigate them through the system. Systems at the same time, we found issues as well with domestic, domestic incidents reports weren't filled out right, correctly. Victims worried about order of protections being renewed and advocates on the ground had to relay the message that they were automatically reviewed, renewed. Order of protections are in protection. They actually are a tool that abusers use to keep track of victims. We need crucial so solutions to provide victim safety when victims come into precinct. They should be talking to an officer from the DV unit or even <clears throat> sometimes that isn't effective. So DV advocates should be implemented in the structure of the way that the police support victims. It's important. When victims fill any police report out, it should not lead to an automatically ACS investigation. Reach out to the DV community led org to assist with that victim and his family's needs so that families can stay together. Reality is that there is so much more work to be done if we listen to one another and understand that there are solutions so we can help victims and survivors get the things that they need. We must shift the narrative because you don't see bruises doesn't mean that the victim isn't telling the truth. We must build a care informed system that cares for the victim as a whole. <clears throat> we got work to do. While training is great, but it's not effective, what good is training if it's not effective? Survivors and DV advocates are the experts of their experience and should be implemented in any policy and safety of victims of DV. As a survivor that went through these systems, my abuser got caught and so I didn't get caught until after 13 months after I reported him. Instead, I received an order of protection for just two years. He was released even after, before I even got that order of protection because NYPD couldn't find him. I gave every known address the NYPD rep repeatedly did wellness checks and asked if I knew where he was at, not realizing that was the victim as the victim as victimizing in itself. Why would I know that? It had been a year after I got away from him. I'm here as an advocate, but also as a thriver and a survivor, saying that NYPD has to start handling DV cases with care and compassion and start understanding that victims and survivors aren't really are going to fully trust systems because we already are dealing with being in prison. So have the ones that know how to identify DV implement these policies. Survivors that testify today, I, my heart goes out to you, but reality as a black woman and justice throughout these systems is normal for myself and being victimized by N NYPD is nothing new. So today I speak for survivors that lost their lives to DV and victims and survivors that are still struggling through these systems. NYPD being overworked isn't an excuse. We have to do better. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we will move on to Karen, followed by Kelly Dwyer and then Gina Tron. Go ahead, Karen. Starting time. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you to the city council members for, for providing us this forum and also for the police leadership, advocates and survivors. In 2017, I met a man through the internet. After one date, he broke into the dating site where we met, changed the password to lock me out and deleted messages from my mailbox. After doing this a dozen times, he fanned out and hacked into my email and social media accounts internet provider account and bank accounts. There were hang up calls and harassing texts always disguised. There was a key logger and other malware planted on my computer. After spending months on my own trying unsuccessfully to stop this, there was a financial crime. And at that point I reported all of the harassment to NYPD. My first shock was when a civilian employee at the station said, you're lucky someone loves you so much. The case was assigned to a detective who said he really didn't understand computers and he didn't understand the internet. And later he finally just said, you know, we don't investigate cyber stalking because it's only a misdemeanor. He ignored the computer tampering, which I believe is a felony. And then and this really shocked me. He told me it was my job to uncover not just evidence, but forensic proof of the perpetrator's identity at which point NYPD would make an arrest. In fact, I did hire a cybersecurity investigator and an attorney to gather evidence that I gave to NYPD, and I'll show it to you. I gave them this notebook, but this man was never arrested and they did not want to investigate the crime. Desperate for help, I contacted the SVD, SVD through the sex crime hotline, the cyber crime squad, and a domestic violence officer all repeated what the detective had said they didn't investigate cyber stalking. Either it's too hard, it was hard to get subpoenas approved by legal, they were too busy, or cyber stalking wasn't part of their mission. There's more to my story, but because it's hard to understand what it's like to be cyber stalked until you've lived through it, I want to briefly tell you the impact of this. First of all, I lost three years of my life because trying to regain my privacy and fix my equipment became a part-time and sometimes a full-time job. I had moved to New York to work in media, but because of this ongoing crime, I removed my online presence to try to flee from the uh, stalker and my career stalled. I also spent about $15,000 repairing and replacing my devices, hiring legal and investigative experts to do NYPD's job for them and moving my house household to try to stop the cyber stalking, but nothing worked. In the initial phase of this, I didn't know if this man was going to physically harm me or maybe someone I was seeing. So after months, I started suffering panic attacks and they became frequent. In the second year, I, the panic was abated but because I realized he was probably not going to come and assault me or hurt somebody I cared about. But it was also clear that because the NYPD would not investigate this, this harassment would go on unabated. It was my new normal. And realizing this, I sunk into a depression. By the third year of being cyber stalked, I just got angry and I decided to speak out to change the landscape for other victims. And I'll leave you with this. What haunts me still is knowing that because this man was never held accountable by NYPD, he is at liberty to stalk and harass women with impunity. He is free to turn their lives inside out as he did mine. And I think that's a crime. Thank you for listening and I'll answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony. <clears throat> um, next up will be Kelly Dwyer followed by Gina Tron. Kelly, you may begin. Starting time. Okay, hi, thank you. Um, uh, excuse me if I'm like a little bit all over the place. Um, I'm visiting my family and all of the notes that I have for my cases um, are back in California where I live now. I actually left New York because of the way my cases were handled. Um, and I do hope, like I wanted to say, my, you know, I've heard so much of my own story in um, other survivor stories today. Um, it, it's hard for me to even, I feel like I'm just saying the same thing, but that's the point, you know, I'm not uh, an exception. It seems like 
well, you know, it's going, it's pervasive. Um, and I do hope that our bravery and our vulnerability make this a better situation. But I honestly do not believe that this is going to make a difference. But I'm here and I'm going to try. Um, a quick aside, um, I, I, like I said, I've, I've had uh, two uh, sexual assault cases. Um, the first one was very much like Christine's. Um, I ended up having to do my own detective work. I collected all my video evidence and my case was dropped twice. And I just, I don't even want to talk about that case because talk about my second case. Uh, in 2017, I was raped on the roof of my uh, apartment building where I lived uh, by a man who I had uh, met on uh, walking home. He said he would walk me home. I don't really need to get into the details of that, I don't think. I'd rather speak on how, um, how much worse <laughs> I feel uh, the police, uh, how, how much, I'm sorry, um, I didn't really want to use too many notes because that I'm very emotional, so I will look at my notes. Um, um, here instead to talk about the worst thing that ever happened to me. That was the second worst thing. The, the worst thing that ever happened to me, um, you know, was the way the NYPD handled my case. Um, you know, it's one thing to say, you know, rapists are terrible human beings, but I got to say the NYP beat them on this one for me. Um, you know, I was taught I could, tr I could trust the police. Um, they were there to serve. They were there to protect. They were there to catch the bad guy. They're, you know, they have badges, they have guns, they have power. And instead, what's obvious to me here today, then, um, is that they need uh, training, reform, and empathy. Their, their role, the gaslighting, the condescension, the victim blaming, the insensitivity, the comp incompetence it was more psychologically dam damaging, like I said, than even the rape itself. The cops who were at the scene uh, continually tried to shape the statement, my statement, pushed a narrative that did not exist and was not true. Um, the very tone and the questioning made me feel like I was a suspect, I was a criminal, and they very much made me feel like I was somehow lying by telling the truth, um, that I was an adulterer, that I had a reason to be ashamed or to hide reality, and I felt, I felt immediate anger, I felt deep sadness, I felt I was in danger, and for even having called them. Um, specifics, I want to say, because I think this, that really helps um, uh, show you what I'm talking about. Um, uh, when I was getting my, uh, my, when I was in the hospital, getting my rape kit done, the, the officers were there and a female officer, and again, I wish I had all my notes because I have all the names, but I don't have them here. I'm sorry about that. Female officer kind of leaned in on an aside and like we were on some kind of team together or something and said, you know, the HIV medication is very, very difficult on your system. So, you know, if you don't have to take it, you know, I, I, I wouldn't. Insinuating that what had happened, what had occurred was between me and someone I knew or trusted or whatever, and that I had been caught or something uh a tryst and nefarious situation was going on and that was certainly not the case um now this is um i think one of the most important things and again if i get something about this wrong the the name or the wording i apologize i don't have my notes here i was eventually called into the da's office for what i was very optimistic i was understandably nervous but i was optimistic they, they were had they had caught my rapist and uh, I felt like I was time for vindication, that was, we were going to move forward, we we're going to bring him to justice, I was going to go to court. Instead, I was shocked and I was heartbroken. And I will never recover from what happened in this meeting. Because instead of trying to find my rapist, which there was plenty of video, there was a, not of the rape itself, but there was a leading up to, uh, you know, they have the rape kit, they had all the, all the things they needed. Instead of putting a case together and finding my rapist, they sat me down and they showed me video of me walking with him, video of me talking to him, video of him holding a heavy bag of mine and said that this made it look like I knew him and wanted to be with him. So they were not willing to pursue the case any further. I had my, uh, 
I had an advocate with me only of only because I did that on my own, not because anyone helped me find an advocate. I did bring an advocate. She was shocked. She was horrified at the way I was treated, but neither of us knew what to do at that point. Um, and last, I want to say, and she was from the Brooklyn Coalition. I want to say that because if anyone else needs uh, an advocate, please um, look them up. They're amazing. Um, I want to reiterate how I had to pay for my own rape, uh, not only through my taxes to fund the police, to help find my rapists, which they never did, uh, but uh, I had to pay for all my counseling. I had to uh, pay for my husband's counseling. You know, this affects other people and your family, people who love you. And um, I had to pay for my follow-up, OBGY and uh, visits. And um, I could never get uh, reimbursed for that. So I'm just gonna leave it at that. Um, I, I know a lot of, there's other women that wanna speak and I just appreciate being hurt. But again, I don't believe anything's gonna happen. And I really hope I'm wrong. Please change the system, please. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you for your testimony, Kelly. Next, we have Gina Tron, followed by Kelly Grace Price, followed by Angelina Rosado. Starting time. My name is Gina Tron, and I really appreciate the time to be heard. I was kidnapped in Park Slope by a serial rapist in 2010, and then transported to a second location in Sunset Park where I was raped. I hesitated going to the police because I was using drugs at the time. I assumed they that they would treat me poorly for that reason, and I was already being very, very hard on myself. Within a few days, though, I decided to report it because I knew in my heart that this man had done this before, and I couldn't live with myself if I did nothing to stop him from hurting others. He was a predator, and this wasn't a time of opportunity. He was brazen and violent in his attack, and I truly feared that he was going to murder me. When I walked into a police station in Brooklyn, I was beyond relieved when the officer I first talked to, a man at that, was respectful and sensitive about my situation. While at the hospital, I was told that SVU detectives would be coming in to interview me. My initial reaction was that these guys would be even easier to talk to that they would at least pretend to care like the SVU detectives on television. But as we all know, life is not a TV show. Two men walked in and did the good cop, bad cop routine I've long heard of, like I was a suspect. The bad cop made it clear through his body language and demeanor that he didn't wanna be there and thought it was a waste of his time. One of the first questions he asked me was, what makes you think you got raped? He asked, if I was a party girl, focused on what I was wearing and my intoxication. He told me that this case probably wouldn't go anywhere because I was on drugs. He criticized me for not running away sooner. For the record, I did literally run away and into the streets. He tried to discourage me from going forward, but I was determined to keep going. Later at the SVU office, the same officer continued to discourage me as I looked through mugshots, telling me I was wasting his time. He also kept commenting to another officer about how I looked like one of their colleagues. They were eyeing me and looking me up and down as if we were at a bar. I told him to please stop talking about my appearance and that I'd feel more comfortable if I had a friend stop by to be with me. I did not have a victim's advocate with me, nor did I understand that I could. He told me that they were doing me a favor by humoring my iffy rape case. He threatened to drop my case completely if I kept giving him attitude, was his phrase. After that interaction, I got a call from a new SVU detective I had never talked to before. He said that they had tracked down my rapist and linked him to two other reports of sexual assault by two other women who reported him independently of each other and months apart from each other. I was then reassigned to this officer who treated me with the basic respect that any human being should receive, maybe because my claims had been substantiated. While the rapist was indicted on multiple counts of rape, he is still out on the streets to this day because apparently the DA's office made mistakes prosecuting him. 
It haunts me to this day that they, like some of the people at the SVU, didn't find me and others to have much worth as a person. I had to testify twice in front of the grand jury and the treatment I received from the DA's office was horrific. They showed me pictures of me from the internet that my rapist private investigator gathered as they prepared for trial, photos of me in bathing suits for my Facebook and costumes and weird doodles I made online, telling me that some of this was damning evidence that hurt my credibility. Even though I testified for them twice, they told me not to contact their office anymore. Very recently, a fourth woman contacted me to let me know that this man also attacked her in ways that were even more violent and shocking than I ever thought he was capable of. I have reason to believe that he has attacked more than a dozen women. Not only was this an injustice for me, but for the safety of women of, women of Brooklyn as a whole. And yet I was encouraged to not even try to get him off the streets by the Special Victims Unit. I can only imagine how many other reports of violent rapists were discouraged over the years by the Special Victims Unit. I've held many jobs in my life, and if I treated any of the customers or clients with the disdain and disrespect that I was treated with in this situation, I would have been fired or reprimanded severely. And I was not a customer. I was the victim of a horrific crime. The way I was treated by the NYPD was more traumatic in many ways than the rape because I didn't expect the rapist to have any moral compass, but I expected this department to. Please do better. I wouldn't wish this how I felt, how I was treated uh, on my worst enemy. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we're gonna call in Kelly Grace Price, followed by Angelina Rosado, followed by Dorchin Leindhoff, followed by Robert Malik. That's starting uh, time. Yes, go ahead, Kelly. Hi, good afternoon. This is Kelly Grace Price. <clears throat> I'd like uh, to address you first, um, Inspector King. We've met. Remember, you worked on the JTTF with my friend Oscar. You know my story. Most of the people on this call know my story, and I don't want to spend a lot of time going over it. I do want to add, though, that I finally have proof that my version of my story is true, that I was maliciously pimped by an informant of the district attorney's office. They held on to phones that I had given over to prove my narrative in 2001 during a queen for a day with the Manhattan district attorney's office for nine years after my charges were dismissed. So I never had proof and I finally got those phones back. And now, speaking of victims still having to pay to prove their innocence, I've had to hire a forensic expert for Cellbrite software to give proof to the court that my version of the story is true. It never ends. And Mr. King, I know that you took this job because you had your choice of all the positions in NYPD to take because of your success on the Joint Terrorism Task Force. And I'm looking for you in earnest to do something because I've been coming to these hearings since my first um, experience trying to climb out of trafficking in 2013. And every year in 2015, as Sonia Asario mentioned, the first DOI report came out. In 2018, the second DOI report, we've seen at least four of the Special Victims Unit since 2008 alone. I don't even know the name of the current Special Victims Unit Chief. Where are they today, sir? Why aren't they answering questions? I want to focus the rest of my time, and I'll, I'll really try and keep it quick, on intro 1488, because as futile as I believe these hearings have been, we can pass legislation, and intro 1488 has been hanging out there since the wake of the last Special Victims Unit hearing at City Hall. And that is Councilwoman Rose's intro demanding that we have transparency in case closures of special victims cases and sexual assault and related sexual abuse cases from the NYPD. And this is going to require some um, work with the district attorney's offices and all the boroughs to provide proper closure rates. I've sent around to most of the council members on this my revisions for intro 14. I suggest that we ask the DA's office to report directly to the city council 
I don't believe that this game of telephone with reporting data is ever efficacious. I've also circulated a brief, and I will turn in again in my test, my written testimony, a brief that shows that the data currently available from the mayor's office to end gender-based violence. By the way, where are they today? The NYPD and the um, uh, NYC open data, the scant data on sexual abuse cases is not even matching between those two entities. It hasn't been. And I, I cannot fathom a place where intro 1488 could reap proper reporting if the DA's offices all had to report to the NYPD and then the NYPD had to filter the, all that information back to the city council. We will never get efficacious reporting through a third party. And I think that this is the biggest change that we can make. If we have transparency in reporting, we can keep people accountable. I want to add a couple quick things <clears throat> that I think are really important and, and no one ever discusses them in the city council uh, or in the mayor's office to end gender based violence or in the downstate coalition against sexual violence. But I would add that there is federal reporting on case closures um, that the Bureau of Justice Statistics requires and uh, the NYPD and the city of New York to provide every year in order to get our federal funding. Who keeps these reports? Who keeps this data? I'm talking specifically about the reports that are due under public law 96.157, the 1979 amendment to the Omnibus Crime Control and Safe Streets Act, and also public law 90-351 <clears throat> that requires assault and harassment data to be reported by state and municipalities to the Bureau. These reports are not transparent. We don't know um, who passes on this information and what it says, but it would be great to have these reports transparent. Um, my FOIL attempts have been very futile. I also haven't heard anyone talk about rate kit processing. I have FOILed and I have the data. I'll put it in my testimony, but um, no one will be surprised that rape kit processing has plummeted to almost 10% of what it was pre-pandemic. And this is an issue that needs to be flagged. I'll put it in my testimony as well. Um, regarding uh, um, sexual assault reporting, um, the, the, the first thing that we can do um, is look at the reports that the Special Victims Unit has even provided us, the scant reporting on their website. <clears throat> they say some things that are very alarming. For instance, um, there are the only data complaint and staffing statistics systems division and um, that specific language on that report reflects that the New York City Police Department only is re reporting on cases opened. But this is new language. I haven't seen this before, cases opened. Why aren't you reporting on cases that people report to you? Um, is there a distinction here? Uh, is there a difference between these two categories? Or is it purely semantic? But when I see these things on the, the language change suddenly on official reports, I get worried that in fact, you're not even reporting on all the people uh, who have given complaints. And I, I believe from the testimony that we've heard today from various people, that this is a reality, that my fear of looking at your web page and the language on your reporting is definitely a reality. I'd like that to be parsed out, Mr. King. Please, um, I'd, I'd, I'd really like an answer to that. You can answer state coalition. Um, I think if we have transparent reporting, not only if we know what's flowing to the federal government, but we know what's flowing from our city agencies, Oftentimes, city agencies do their own investigative reporting on sexual assaults. If you look at New York City open data, the fire department from the city of New York has not reported one rape or sexual assault to the NYPD in the last 15 years. Now, we know this isn't true just from news reports. Um, the same with the Department of Correction. The, the number of rapes and sexual assaults the DOC is reporting to the NYPD to be passed along to the Bureau of Justice Statistics is only 11% of what they've even reported publicly. So as long as we have some reporting, we can start to hack away at these issues. But keeping the data hidden and mysterious, as Councilwoman Rose referred to at the beginning of this hearing, is the and the city government to per perpetuate. 
So as long as we have a little modicum of data transparency, I'll be happy if the results of this hearing and everyone that have come forward to testify actually bring the fruit of, of reporting that is solid and we get continuously on a constant basis. I'm tired of the sound of my voice. Thank you so much for listening to me and I will submit my written testimony. Well, thank you, Kelly. Next, we'll move on to Angelina Rosado, followed by Dorchin Leindholt and Robert Malik. Angelina, you may Hi, begin. Hi, everyone. All Starting right. time. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Angelina Rosado. I am a domestic violence survivor, as well as the founder and executive director of a nonprofit domestic violence organization here in New York City. Um, I'm quite surprised with the lack of um, presence for domestic violence in this room, being that, you know, we know that domestic violence numbers have only skyrocketed um, even before the pandemic. Um, you know, crime was down during, before the pandemic and domestic violence was one of the only crimes that actually numbers, they did not see a decrease in, they only see the rise in it. So um, I'll get started. Um, my issue, I have a couple issues, okay. One, NYPD, I will address the three people that are sitting there. Um, when talking about, you know, police interaction with, and, with um, domestic violence victims, it is absolutely horrendous, okay? Um, we have specifically, as well as people of color, um, there's 36,000 police officers, only 400 are assigned to the domestic violence units. And there's not enough to spread out throughout our, diff our five different boroughs. You know, I've worked, I just, we just had a domestic violence march in Harlem, which we worked at the 28th precinct, where we found out there's only two domestic violence officers in that unit. That makes absolutely no sense being that, you know, domestic violence in Harlem is extremely high. So if you only have three, two to maybe three or four officers even responding to domestic violence, knowing that not only do they have to respond to the domestic violence calls, they have to do home visits, which takes both of them out of the, out of the um, precinct. And now when a victim comes in, there's no one there to actually interact. When we're talking on domestic violence, we have to be extremely, um, I can't press, the, press it enough about, you know, trauma-informed training. I know um, you guys spoke a lot about this trauma-informed training that we keep hearing about, yet we have yet to see it actually um, be implemented. So I'm just confused. So what is this training that we keep hearing about? Um, you know, I, you guys had repeated yourselves about this trauma-informed training a lot. Um, as you guys said, it's like, what, a, two weeks for, you know, officers, um, one week for new officers. That makes absolutely no sense because when it comes to tra being trauma-informed, is this a one-time training? Are we doing this every two months, every two weeks? Like, what is the, what is the process for that? Um, NYPD is responding to over 230,000 calls of domestic violence. That is 600 calls a day. There's no way that 400 officers can respond to all that and not be overwhelmed. You know, um, we talked about possibly adding more officers. That is exactly what we do not need. We do not need more officers on who are not trained properly. We need the officers that are already in place to have some serious training. And when we talk about training, make sure who that training includes, right? I don't have no clue who's giving you guys the training. You know, you guys just said that in a year, you know, there was no training happening yet there were still officers out responding to these calls. So untrained officers are now responding to, to sexual assault calls as well as domestic violence calls. Um, when we're, we talk about domestic violence victims actually even going in and speaking, a lot of them don't even know that there's a domestic violence unit. I deal with a lot of victims. I train a lot of victims on even how to go into the office to even speak, um, making sure that they're able to even access domestic violence unit, which now I've learned a lot of them Officers aren't even there. The domestic violence unit officers are not even there because they're out making house calls. So that is an issue. Um, we talk about victim shaming. You know, I've had a lot of um, victims come to me and state when they go to speak to officers, they are shut down. You know, I've heard stories where officers are asking them, well, why did it take you this long? Well, why didn't you just leave? And if, if officers are trauma-informed, trained, as you guys had stated several times, 
there's no way that an officer would ask that kind of question at all to a victim of domestic violence, as well as I'm sure a victim of sexual assault. Um, when we talk about, we t I'm gonna talk about law, like this is what needs to be changed. We need to have laws in domestic violence. As you all know, there's no actual domestic violence crime, which is a problem, right? Now, when we decide to start talking about domestic violence laws and I'm trying to push, you know, domestic violence becoming a, a felony, we have to make sure that the language on this law is correct because what I what we don't need is for victims to now, for the system to be able to turn it and now victims are the people who are arrested for one, protecting themselves or even speaking up for themselves. Um, Connecticut just passed the Jennifer Law, which now allows victims of domestic violence that experience mental and emotional support to be able to get orders of protection. New York City has to back this up because unlike physical, violence of physical abuse you can't prove mental and emotional abuse there's no way for you to prove it. it's literally your word against someone else's so that's another issue um when i speak we're going to speak on wellness checks that is not mandatory of nypd that is an issue when it comes to domestic violence unfortunately there's no law that states that nypd is mandated to do a wellness check that's a problem there's no way that that should even be a thing right now, when it comes to women of color specifically, we have the highest numbers on domestic violence. We are taking the least serious when it comes to domestic violence. Officers have looked at women of color and basically laughed in their faces, okay? I've had a person of the LGBTQ community, a trans woman come to me and she stated, you know, officers laughed at me when I walked into the precinct in Queens. I was mortified from this woman's experience. And I'm not sure whether it was due to her being a woman, whether it was due to her being a, a member of the LGBTQ community. But as we know, the LGBTQ community has the highest numbers in domestic violence um, compared to heterosexuals, which is another issue. And I need NYPD to get on board with us. You know, um, Senator Rose, I, uh, I applaud you. I looked at your bill. Um, I completely agree with you. When it comes to um, making a committee to actually hold NYPD not only just accountable, but being at this table when we're talking about trainings, what is this training looking like? How long is this training going to take to actually be implemented? And are we making sure that officers are mandated to take this training? That's what needs to happen because if your if your times are showing that officers are not doing it, and we're going to use COVID as an excuse, Zoom works perfectly fine. Okay, Zoom has been helping us through this pandemic this whole entire time. So that is not an excuse for domestic violence victims to go unheard, unseen, and it's not an excuse to sweep domestic violence under the rug. Um, I thank you guys for your time. And if you have any questions, please, I'm here to um, answer anything. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, we have two individuals to continue. Um, Council members, a reminder, if you have any questions, use the Zoom raise hand function. Um, we're gonna finish uh, today off with uh, Dorchen Leidholt, followed by Robert Malik. Um, please uh, go ahead. Thank you so much. And I'd like to, oh, sorry. You may begin. Shall I continue? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you so much. I'd like to second everything that Angelina Rosado just said. Um, so powerful. Um, since 1994, I've served as the director of Sanctuary for Family Center for Battered Women's Legal Services. Like many of you, I was blown away by the story of yesterday's New York Times fighting back with her own badge. In 1993, Katrina Brown was repeatedly denied police protection from her violent boyfriend a corrections officer at Rikers who beat, raped, tortured, and imprisoned her. Katrina Brown went on to have a successful 20-year career at NYPD, rising to the rank of first grade detective. One troubling facet of the story is that Detective Brown had to conceal her history of victimization and her survivorship from her supervisors and fellow officers at NYPD. She knew that she would be divested of her credibility and worse if she revealed it. NYPD proudly reports that it is the most diverse police department in the country. It is crucially important that NYPD recognize 
that part of that commitment to diversity entails recruiting, promoting, and honoring officers like Detective Katrina Brown. The article takes us back to a time when police officers responding to a domestic violence 911 call would tell the abuser to take a walk around the block or tell the victim to go to family court. This is what I saw over and over again when I started at Sanctuary for Families. Fortunately, as a result of laws and policies passed in response to such lawsuits and highly publicized tragedies, as well as concerted advocacy, NYPD's response to domestic violence began to improve. Dedicated domestic violence police officers were placed in every precinct. New recruits received training about domestic violence at the police academy. Take a walk around the block became history. But NYPD's response to domestic violence still falls far short of what it should be. Let me give you an example. On May 21st of this year, NYPD officers from Manhattan's 25th precinct showed up at the Harlem apartment of Hunter College nursing student, Elena Hardy. She had called the police six times before this seventh call, reporting crimes of violence by her abusive boyfriend. Instead of trying to find him or taking steps to protect Elena, the officer simply took another report and left. Less than an hour later, Elena's batterer broke into her apartment through the fire escape and stabbed her to death. What is needed to ensure that there are no more victims who report domestic violence only to be left to die at the hands of their clearly homicidal intimate partners? Clearly, it is training supervision and accountability. Um, while domestic violence prevention officers are intensively trained, they are not patrol officers like those who responded to Elena's 77911 calls. What is urgently needed is mandatory annual training of domestic, on domestic violence, sexual assault, and human trafficking for all police officers responding to 911 calls and their supervisors. The training must cover a range of relevant topics, including but not limited to the dynamics of domestic violence, uh, including abuser tactics of power and control, danger and lethality factors in domestic violence cases, the criminal provisions of the Family Protection Domestic Violence Intervention Act of 1994, which many officers are not acquainted with, it's become clear, techniques of trauma-informed policing, and resources, including shelter and non-residential services. This training must be supplemented by trainings conducted at least monthly at roll call. The training should be overseen by an interdisciplinary interagency committee that meets at least quarterly, includes in addition to representatives from city agencies, representatives of domestic violence service providers. Agencies, and service providers should be encouraged to select representatives who are survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, and or human trafficking. NYPD should provide to this committee annual data on the number of police officers trained, the dates of the training, and the curriculum used for each training session. An annual report on the status of the training should be sent to the mayor, the speaker of New York's council, and should Council's Public Safety Committee and Committee on Women's and Gender Equity. Domestic violence policing is demanding, dangerous work that requires officers with state of the art training and supervision. NYPD officers are fully equipped to protect victims and prevent future violence against them. New York City will finally realize through injuries prevented and lives saved, the full potential of almost three decades of criminal laws, strengthening the protection of domestic violence victims. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Thank you for your testimony. Um, up next is, I believe, Robert Malik. Um, if anyone else, go ahead, Robert. If anyone else has anything else, I believe that everyone else has testified, but please, uh, use the Zoom raise hand function if I missed anyone uh, who has registered. Um, go ahead, Robert. Thank you. Starting uh, time. The name is Robert Malik, uh, ACScomplaints.com. Uh, I'm a New York State notary public. 
a New York City license process server, New York State license guard, three years New York City auxiliary police, and a licensed Mississippi private investigator. Um, what I would like to say is that if anyone wants to contact me uh, after after this is over, not for any services of mine, that's not why I'm here, um, but any anyone that wants to contact me, the council's uh, more than welcome to provide any of my contact information. Um, for one, I, I'd like to start by saying that what, what message as a role model does it send to NYPD by the council regarding how much effort and, and time to put into handling uh, of victims um, when you put up a time clock? Uh, you know, one thing that we would not want to have happen when we go into a, a, a police station is to have a time clock. And I think that what we're, we're asking for is we're asking for people who, who care uh, and, and spend the time to investigate our cases diligently and with compassion. And by the council putting up a time clock on, on the public, when the public is the one that puts you in your position, as well as NYPD, is contrary to really what's happening in, in, in our city. Um, you know, we, we can talk about, about um, polishing the Lamborghini as much as we want, about let's do this or let's do this or do that. But, you know, the point is, is, is that you have to have people that actually care. And it's critical that you have people like myself and other people to come forward and report as far as what's truly happening. Because the police and people in power, they can talk about what they do and don't do all day long. But I think what we're finding here today is that they're not giving us the basics. Okay? And you don't get to realize that until you speak to people like myself and you realize that wait a minute maybe we're you know maybe we're assuming one fact and then henceforth assuming all others that we're assuming that um inspector king is not a fraud okay now in my personal opinion and evidence that i feel that i have that i will share uh, uh with every member of the council and i've sent uh, some emails last night and i will be sending a lot more I will be sending direct evidence on Spectre King that in my personal opinion, and the evidence that I have is that this man directly is a fraud and should be fired. Okay. So he can talk about all he wants about what he does and doesn't do and all this nonsense. But the fact about the matter is that's not really what he does. Not in my experience. It isn't. So the council is assuming that we're talking to an inspector like, wow. But the fact of the matter is we have to get to the point of, is this inspector a fraud and a lie? And you don't know that unless you spend the time with people like myself, with people in the panelists to come forward, because for every one person there is of someone like me, there's got to be 10,000 more that's not here today. So it's critical that we come forward. Um, and, um, you know, one, one point I like to make is, is that, you know, we talk about all these different changes with the police department. But one thing that I experience consistently, and I think everybody else has, has anyone tried calling the police and notice how fast? the police actually say their names and how they mumble them. You don't even hear what their name is. They do that intentionally. So that way they're not accountable. And this happens again and again and again. So the mere basics of what they should be providing, are they, are they really providing it? And um, uh, in, in, in what I wrote here, uh, I said, I'm here today in representation of, of the cause for women's equality and proper treatment and protection for them by the special victims uh, squads of New York City. And before we address the needs of women though, we have to ensure the needs of women are upheld while they are children. Such are the most defenseless in our, in our society. And my wonderful daughter, Margaret Malik is one of them. I have a great deal of evidence as to how ACS of New York City and the child abuse squad of Brooklyn and special victims of Manhattan are an absolute pathetic disgrace. I'll provide uh, such evidence to all members of council about this causes directly. Uh, now I'll provide some information um, I'd like to, to thank Sergeant Mitchell, the adult special victims of Brooklyn, for informing me of a secret investigation fraud taken up by the Brooklyn Child Abuse Special Victim Squad with no knowledge to me. I have that investigation fraud and I've shared it by email uh, with the council members. And to begin, um, I'd like to state that Lieutenant Keene, the special victim of Manhattan, has said to me the comment in regards to my daughter's stepbrother, your daughter's actually with this kid? Thus said, after I provided him with all evidence of October 11, 2018, 
and toenail incident of October 2018, he had not one question or comment and allowed misdemeanor statute of limitations to pass. Didn't this ever discuss with me if it could be charged as a felony where the statute of limitations would not be passed. Keenan claimed ongoing, well, it's ongoing, so it's still okay. However, you can't assume further charges until you have investigated them to claim ongoing to begin with. For six weeks, Keenan uh, uh, and evidence of these of these two assaults and more, and not one question or, or, or comment. My efforts to have Michael King directly take up this matter, uh, um, uh, and 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 I reported King's actions uh, uh, to him, and Michael uh, Michael uh, King ignored me, um, and I have those emails, and I'll provide it to the council. Previous inspector Rowe, before Michael King came in, a man special victim who said to me that she would have arrested Margaret and Joe after providing her evidence of crimes against my daughter, but my daughter was too young to be put on the witness stand. For some reason, Detective Rowe does no interrogation of Margaret Joe, nor does she speak to many potential witnesses to the crime, such as neighbors. She also does not follow up as my daughter is of, is of age now. And um, I have tried to contact Michael King and he has ignored me. Well, we have, have closed unsolved cases. What about when a child comes of age where a child can speak? What is special victims doing about that? Uh, as far as I know, they haven't done anything regarding my daughter. Roe, uh, now moving forward, Roe confirmed that Detective Sardina of, of Manhattan Special Victims there did not investigate the matter of when my child's mother was holding down my daughter and her, and her stepbrother was biting off her toenail with his teeth, causing her to bleed. Sardina has since retired with history of 11 lawsuits against him. Of note, Kelly Casey, ADA of Brooklyn, has mandated the investigation of the toenail incident. Detective Gerardo of Brooklyn Special Victims have told me I didn't do that investigation either because, as he said, quote, I don't believe it could have even happened. When I informed Kelly Casey, she the email correspondence, a total color of law, cover your bases, make believe I'm doing my job, illegal fraud. An investigation that was supposed to have taken place and knowing to everyone never did. The following is report from Marissa Friedberg coming from, coming from ACS themselves. Now, this is just to hear this, this is going to shock you when, when you hear this. 15 year old, which is which the kid that's assaulting my daughter, is diagnosed with bipolar disorder and has history of being extremely violent. On or about 12 13, 2017, subject child was arrested after assaulting his father to the point of unconsciousness. Biological father is now currently deceased. His father died soon after he killed his father. Subject child was hospitalized in May 2018 of psychiatric reasons. Biological mother is aware, and, and this report here uh, came from Marissa Friedberg, licensed mental health clinician, right out of ACS, okay? Says here, Bio Bio's mother is aware and has failed to follow through with recommended medical and mental health treatment. Subject child has not received his medication or gone for recommended counseling since September of 2018. As a result, subject child has become physically violent towards five-year-old subject child, which is my daughter. Sometime in February of 2019, 15-year-old subject child threw five-year-old subject child, which is my daughter, with excessive force, causing her to bite her tongue, which bled as a result. Sometime in March of 2019, five-year-old so the child sustained an unexplained red mark and scratch to a left cheek. On June 17, 2019, five-year-old subject child sustained a one and a half inch laceration to the back of her head. On August 9, 2018, 15-year-old subject child, five-year-old subject child into a wall, excessive force resulting in head pain. Five-year-old subject child was hospitalized on October 11, 2018, after being thrown by 15-year-old subject child. Further details are known. On October 18, 2018, Father's and mother held five-year-old subject child down and allowed 15-year-old subject child to bite the child's toenail, causing this to bleed. Five-year-old subject child has sustained multiple injuries that are inconsistent with the explanation given by the biological mother. On October 23, five-year-old subject child sustained unexplained bruising around her neck and being choked. On November 2, 2018, five-year-old subject child sustained unexplained bruising to her left cheek. Father's and mother failed to seek medical treatment for one or more incidents with five-year-old subject child. Father's your mother is aware of the 15 year old son of child's violence and out of control behavior and continues to allow him around my daughter. Father's your mother is, has a history of being verbally abusive to my daughter, five year old subject child, due to the ongoing violence and emotional abuse. Five year old subject child has been exhibiting anxious behavior and acts fearful of the violent father's your mother and 15 year old subject child. I have provided this evidence over to Lieutenant Keenan. He doesn't get back to me for, for uh, the six weeks regarding any, any questions at all. I've, I've, I've tried to reach out to uh, Michael King there, who claims to be uh, whatever. He's ignored. And there's a lot more. 
feel for the women here that have been assaulted, but for God's sake, my daughter's abuse is going on for years. It's a nightmare that she can't step out of. And the last time that I was at the city council hearing, I said that, that the police have be blocked in their system where they will not take any police report for me for a period of two years, okay? Because and New York City is doing a CYA on New York City because my daughter's under ACS New York City jurisdiction and New York City doesn't want liability on New York City. All right, I got some very serious problems with a very young little girl who didn't even make it to womanhood yet. And, and I'm not even, my God, I don't even know, I could just keep going over here as far as what has happened. I'll just tell you this, which will shock your mind, is that I sent to every one of the council members here today, I sent my daughter statements of what happened there. I, re I, I reported on tape. I sent it by email to you guys uh, 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 for being thrown by her brother. And you can hear the ACS worker want to take away my phone from me and a supervisor, supervisor take away my phone so I don't have evidence of my daughter's abuse. All right. And then they go and they go to stop visitation with my daughter because I called 911 and I reported my daughter's assault. You know what happened with the judge in, in, in court? Because judges are on top of this too. The judge wrote an order, so I don't have any more evidence of, my, of, of crimes against my daughter that I can't have a witness of visitation. I can't take notes of visitation. I can't record a visitation. If you go on acscomplaints.com on my website, you'll see the pictures of the signs they put up in their facilities for all parents, no recording, no photography, no evidence that any parent could have for abuse or crimes committed against their child. There's a hell of a lot that's going on. There's more I could say, but I mean, I'll leave with that. I appreciate the extra time that you gave me. Um, but um, it's, 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 you know, we talk about how we can make these improvements and stuff, but the mere basics, my God, I think we need to have police that come out of church so they have a heart with well, the DAs or judges. They have their immunities, the, the other DAs, the judges. Look, it's a whole mess. The thing is that we need people that just simply care and have a conscience. It's common sense, a lot of it. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll let it go with that. And I appreciate all the time um that you that you gave me and I'll, I'll i'll provide to all the council members all the evidence that i have to back up what i said and um anyone wants to contact me they're welcome and i appreciate it all sorry i'm, I'm, I'm emotional it's my daughter you know it's my daughter i've suffered with this for years um so it's very hard for me and i thank you for this i thank you for me being able to speak and say what i needed to say thank you god bless thank you thank you thank you for your testimony sir um I believe that is all uh, public testimony at this moment. Um, Councilmember Rosenthal, uh, you have a question, so you may uh, go ahead, followed by, we'll turn to Chair Diaz after that, okay? I, I have a statement, oh. can I go before, um, Chair? Sure. Thank you. Sure. I, I, I just wanna um, go back to Mr. Robert Malik. I, I wondered why you waited for so long for this hearing. I noticed you were sitting in your vehicle. I, I thank you. I, I thank you for staying on point and on task. The, the point of this hearing is to hear from everyone. We're, we're not here to paint a pretty picture for anyone. Again, um, we, we made a conscious decision to extend the time today for the panelists to speak because it's important to us as council members to hear what you're all experiencing. Again, so so thank you for, for not letting the, the, what seems the system strip you of, of your rights. You know, um, I, again, I, I thank you for your testimony. I thank you for putting yourself out there. I cannot speak to the character of Inspector King or the DA and, and what has gone on, but just know that we are here as the council members to listen to you and to advocate as much as possible. I'll turn it over to Councilman Rosenthal. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you so much, Chair Diaz, and thank you to the committee council again. Um, I really want to thank everyone for testifying, and I really appreciate again and again the NYPD staying here and hearing um, all of this testimony. I'm not sure I've ever seen that happen before, um, and it's a pretty powerful um, statement that you're here. Uh, I really just have uh, some um, sort of concluding thoughts and a question. Um, I think the best way that we can thank those who came forward today is to really hear them and make the changes that the DOI report called for. They're so straightforward. Double the number of detectives in SVD. 
um, have a contract with survivor advocate groups so they can be present when a victim walks in the door to an SVD uh, and be there during controlled calls um, and so on. I, I really am shocked to hear over and over again that advocates have not been called in to help survivors on site. Um, I, I'd like to know if the NYPD SVD plans to put out a statement or some sort of report documenting the changes that you'll make and, and uh, following up, tracking those changes. Um, and I have to say that while I appreciate uh, the NYPD members who are here today, you know, the DOI, the 2018 DOI report has come up repeatedly today. And the report made it clear that the problems have been ongoing despite repeated pleas from the head of the SVD from 2014 onward. Um, and it strikes me and it strikes me that the problem stems from NYPD leadership not following through on requests for more detectives, more training, making the SVD a desirable unit by increasing the number of first and second grade detectives. My goodness, since 2018, the number of first and second grade detectives has decreased by more than half. It's gone from 26 down to 12. I, I don't know what incentives we're putting in there for yeah. detectives to want to join yeah. the unit. And I mean, I, you know, Mike King, I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you how much support do you get from leadership above you? And can you give an example? Uh, thank you, Council Member Rosenthal. Um, in regard to promotions. And I have to say, I got here in August of last year. My first conversation was with the police commissioner regarding that very same topic. And since I have been here in the 13 months, he has given us 15 grade promotions. That is from detectives right up to the ranks of supervisors. And um, there's, there have never been that many promotions within special victims in one calendar year. So I believe that is an extremely. Uh, I mean, the reports online don't show that. Perhaps that a per, is a promotion from PO to uh, a detective status, and that's what you're including. No, um, no, not at all. This is only great. This is only great. In fact, today we had two, three, three promotions today uh, for grade for our special victims. Yeah, it's not showing up on the reports, but I hear you. Uh, I don't think you're up to 26, which is where we started in 2018, but I digress. Um, you know, okay, uh, there's an example. Can you give me another example of support you've gotten from your leadership? Can you say it one more time, Council Member? Can you sh talk about, I mean, the example you just gave about, um, the number of first and second grade detectives. Um, overall, to be clear, um, even despite the increases you just got, you're still down I'm from expired. the 2018 number. Um, and I'm wondering, so is there any other type of support you've gotten? Have you, that you've gotten? Can you well, give an example? In terms of personnel, whenever we request personnel, uh, Commissioner Shea has made sure we have gotten personnel. Um, and in regard to the promotions, every promotion ceremony since I've been here, he's given us at least two or three people. So I think that goes a long way to show the support that he has given me since I got here. Basically, there's really nothing that I have asked him for that he hasn't given me. I mean, to be clear, the number of detectives um, went up in 2019, but came back down in 2020. 
I don't have the report from 21, but I'm not seeing online the information that, you know, you're talking about, I guess we'll wait to see the 2021 report. Um, I'm going to leave it there, but I want to emphasize that uh, uh, the things that the survivors are talking about, the way that we can be responsive is by following through, which hasn't happened so far, but is by following through, doubling the number of detectives in the unit from 225 to 450 or 500, giving them the training they need on a regular basis. You know, having a report show that eight people showed up to a, a training uh, is, is appalling. Uh, knowing today that you still have 113 detectives who haven't been fed trained is heartbreaking. Everyone should be getting that training uh, annually. This isn't as you heard from the cases, all of these cases are nuanced, complicated, unique to the individuals who come forward. They're hard cases. And, um, you know, it's a big responsibility to be in the SVD, but the NYPD has an SVD unit. Um, it has the capacity, I think, to be the best in the nation, um, but that's not happening. And that did not change from 2018 to now. In fact, um, you know, as many have said, it, it possibly has gotten worse because the dismantling of several of the units after the 2018 report came out was, uh, you know, very uh, demeaning, demoralizing to people. Um, I'm glad that you decided to reinstate them. They're really the drug, you know, induced rape division is very important. I'm glad it's reinstated. But my gosh, there's so much more work to do. And, you know, I'd love to hear from the NYPD that they're going to commit themselves to making these changes. Thank you. And I guess that was the question. I know uh, from my perspective, I heard everyone here today. Um, I've spoken to yourself before and, and Jay Manning, and I will do my best to make sure we don't have recurrences of this magnitude. Um, I, I, we're definitely still a work in progress. I would never say, say there's no room for improvement. There's always room for, for improvement. But again, going forward, I am trying to make this division as survivor-centric as possible. Thank, thank you, uh, Councilor Rosenthal. Um, we will now turn to uh, Chair Council, or Chair Dharma Diaz. Um, go ahead, ma'am. Uh, I thank you. I see a hand raised, Karen. I don't know if that's a panelist. That yes. Hi. Um, can you hear me? I, I just need approval from Council. Just give, give me a second, Karen. I'm sorry. I, I don't want to be out of order, but I want to be able to give you a space. Are we okay to proceed with Karen? Go, go ahead, Councilmember. Okay, okay, thank you. Move forward, Karen. Thank you, Councilmember Diaz. Um, the reason, I, my question is, I was told so um, unanimously by everyone I spoke with that NYPD does not handle cyber stalking. They don't investigate it and they don't arrest people for it. Like we don't do this full stop. And I wanted to ask um, the, the leadership, I'm sorry, I'm not sure your title, Mr. King, but I wanted to ask, is that in fact NYPD policy or was I misinformed or can someone shed light on that for me, please?
uh, thank you, uh, Karen. Um, we will we will follow up with the, file, the police department on those specific questions, and I will get back to you on that as well. Thank you, sir. Yeah, no problem. Um, we're going to turn back to Chair Diaz um, as well. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. And Chair Diaz, you could go ahead and uh, close this hearing out. Thank you. I, I want to begin by, by thanking all of you, uh, the panelists, the, the activists, the survivors, and even NYPD uh, for staying on. I know we, we asked you to think out the box and work with us today. I, I've chaired many hearings in the last 10 months. And often I've been told administration has to leave. So I, I thank you. Um, as the chair, Jet Committee Women, Gender and Equity, I'm happy to know that our voices were heard, our concerns were listened to. I, I look forward to the many unanswered questions. And, and that, that goes um, not, not only to, to, to King, but also to the DAs that were brought up numerous times, the lack of, of courtesy or responsiveness. You know, I, I also, um, having unfortunately to, I've been on, on either on both sides of NYPD, it resonates with me when what someone stated earlier about police officers, I think it was Mr. Robert, Mr. Robert Malik stated, officers give their names really quickly. And that's a fact. So if, if we could definitely work on that, I, I think that's a, a baby step, a tiny step into correcting the process. Because if we're not able to get our first point of contact straight in together, it makes everything else go on a downhill. Right? I, as someone that's a survivor of domestic violence, I know what it is to, be, to, to know not to be listened to. And that first person we interact with sets the stage for us. So again, I, I want to thank you all for staying on so long. We've been on since 10 o'clock. I, I want to thank Chair Rosenthal for all her questions. Uh, Chair um, Adams had to step away. She had um, another hearing. I, I see we have Christine is, is still on and Chair Rosenthal. If it's a question I, for administration, I prefer to have questions um, emailed over. Rosen, um, the Chair Rosenthal is saying no. So if, okay, and I'll be professional and, and keep in line. I'm gonna ask if we can allow Christine to please speak first and then we'll close it out with Chair Rosenthal's one sure. or two questions. Chair Diaz, we're going to we're going to ask that the members of the public can direct questions to the administration through the city council specifically. So that, you can email correct. me. Yeah, ap apologies. That, that works for me. That, that definitely works. Apologies. For me. I just think that that's the um the the kind of best path forward at this point. So okay. if any of the individuals who have their hand raised at this moment would like to, uh, my email I sent out the Zoom invite, so you should have that contact information, and we will be sure to follow up with each of you individually as well um, on on those specific questions. Thank you for your guidance. Much appreciated. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Chair Rosenthal, you may go ahead, but I, I believe the answer is going to be the same thing in terms of following up questions with the. Uh, okay. Yeah, no, 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 no. It's uh, I, I see the facilities director yeah. sitting uh, has been sitting through this um, entire hearing, and I would be remiss if I didn't say thank you for all of your help in renovating. Uh, the SVD facilities. They were in 2018 abysmal, uh, just in abysmal shape. And, um, you know, this, you, you've, you have made a concerted effort to do this and, um, you know, let the record show that, that your, your work uh, is very, very much appreciated. Um, I, of course, have to say that, you know, <laughs> The facilities are too small by half, right? Because we need twice the number of detectives. But uh, thank you. Thank you for that. 